So here we are, and this is another university lecture series presentation. And so we have the brother, Dr. Jared Ball, who we appreciate, who has come to us all the way from Morgan State University's campus. <laughs> and so for those who might not be familiar with Brother Ball or may not be familiar as much with his work, he's a professor of communication studies in the Institute for Urban Research at Morgan State University. And he's also the founder and curator of media platform I Mix What I Like.org. And it's also uh, here on this slide as well. And he'll be speaking with the topic at hand today, the myth of black buying power. The myth of black buying power. And so as he comes before us, let us open our minds. Let us embrace the importance of critical thinking. If we need to take notes, let us do so. If we need to sit up and uh you know, uh, posture ourselves a certain way so we can internalize and receive the information, let us do so. But just want to remind everybody, if you have a cell phone, if you have an electronic device, if it chirps, if it buzzes, if it whistles, if it rings, if lights flicker, let's please do what's necessary so that way we can be present for this conversation and we can be present for this presentation so there's no distractions and there's nothing that would hinder us from being able to maximize what it is that this brother is going to bring forth today. So with that being said, let's sit back, let's relax, not, let's not relax too much, all right? We don't need any snoring or anybody to fall asleep, but yet let's be comfortable and embrace what it is that this brother hard has worked hard to research, what it is that this brother here has worked hard to uh, delve into uh, by way of uh, his topic, the myth of black buying power. So without further ado, without further delay, please give a warm, black, tastic welcome for Brother Dr. Jared Ball. I say, fam, give it up. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I, first of all, I greatly appreciate the invitation uh, to present on this topic and for all of you to come out, uh, for coming out and you know, missing the, the prince's wedding. And, uh, I know you were struggling with that one. It was a tough choice, but um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate the effort of all those involved here. And uh, um, before we even get started, I just want to, you know, we gave it up for the ancestors, but just a quick other uh, mention that, uh, again, today is the 93rd birthday of Malcolm X. And I think that is a great context in which to have this discussion. Uh, I want to say from the outset, I don't have the solution. I just want to be very clear. The first thing that people usually say to me when they hear uh, my argument on this is, well, but what's the solution? I'm saying I don't have one. I would also be cautious of anyone who stood before anybody and said that they singularly have the solution. I think that's always a, a, a warning flag should go off. Uh, but my real point is, I've only, in this instance, wanted to isolate and try to, in the, in the uh, parlance of Bob Brown, shotgun a particular myth. The solutions to all of our problems will only come from the kind of work exhibited in this space. Collective, political, organized, clear work. That's the only vague hope we have. Um, the details of, about what to do will come out of that and out, out of that understanding and, and work that is generated as organized political groups in Siri not off, available off the record. That was deep. What was that? Siri. There, oh, NSA. Okay, <laughs> good. As long as we know they're listening. Um, uh, in fact, thanks to the FBI's surveillance of my father, I actually learned a lot about him that I would not have otherwise known. So I appreciate, you know, thanks, everybody. You know, <laughs> thanks, FBI. Uh, um, anyway, that's another discussion. Um, so I wanted to just be, be very clear about that. I don't have the solution. I just think that, that, that this uh, particular issue is confusing uh, efforts to get to any solution we might get to. <clears throat> Similarly, I also want to say from the outset, I am not saying and do not mean to be interpreted as saying that we should not try to support black business, black endeavor, 
uh, black entrepreneurialism. I'm not saying that is, is not a goal or shouldn't be a goal. I'm just simply going to argue that that in and of itself will not get us anywhere. That in and of itself, that path is, 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 is not one that leads to collective salvation. All right, so again, I don't have the solution. I'm just challenging this one particular myth. And I'm not saying don't support black business. This is often the critiques I get when people think they've heard what I've said. So I just want to be clear about that and we'll come back to that. Now for me, it, it, this started a little over 10 years ago when, uh, in fact, this is the 10th anniversary of the first uh, uh, effort of, of, of my own and which I still think is the first effort period. And I don't mean to sound arrogant here. I just think that this has been a particular myth that has gone unattended for so long that I just happen to be the first, really the only person to ever really challenge this particular idea and concept. And over 10 years uh, in writing and, and researching it, it has led to more hostility for me than anything else I've ever been involved in. And, it, and to me, it's not even anywhere near any, the, the closest, what I would consider radical or threatening or provocative argument or position I take politically. It just happens to be one that is extremely, um, for a lot of reasons that I think will come to, uh, difficult for people <laughs> to, to, to accept or to, to, to rationalize, in part because it is such a heavily propagandized myth. Uh, and we're gonna talk about it in terms of propaganda and the process and how propaganda works. And because of that, it is successful. Now, I tend to try to start with some, some basics in terms of context. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this and uh, uh, I'm happy to come back to it during Q&A. By the way, if anybody needs me to stop and repeat something or has a quick question, please just let me know. I'm happy to, to, to address it now. Otherwise, I'll come to everything. Uh, I'm happy to get into a, a more deep conversation uh, when we get to Q&A. With everything for me, I start with the colonial premise. That is that everything we're ended up, that I argue, Lisa, that we end up talking about is about the process of colonialism. And that just simply is, in this case, or specifically a group of Europeans conquering the world over the last five or 600 year process, creating colonies, external and internal, to any particular country. Black America, what we call black or African America, was itself created at the same time Europeans were colonizing the rest of the world. And I like to make this point in particular because one, I think it, it helps us reassess and reconnect us on a radical pan-African path when we realize again, that every African continent, or every nation of the African continent was itself being created, uh, most of which after the, the creation of a black internal colony here or an African internal colony here. In other words, African people placed and colonized here should be seen as exactly same part of the same imperial process that created all of the African countries on the continent and all of the so-called Latin American countries in South and Central America uh, and really created the, the, the geopolitical map that we see on the world today. It's all, in fact, every nation in the world is itself a direct or at best an indirect response to European imperialism. So none of them are authentic to the groups of people they claim to house. So in other words, Nigeria is no more an authentically African space than Baltimore. And they were both created as part of the exact same process. So when we're talking about Africans in the United States, yes, there are obvious differences, but we have to understand that it, we exist here as part of the exact same process as every other group around the world. I also like it because it returns black America to that world stage. That while we do have some particular special experiences that, that are unlike elsewhere, we are part of a global population. All right. In the context of imperialism and colonialism, we can only understand media in the context of what those who control it have said for themselves. Those in power have argued and developed this phrase here that media are to give them what they call full spectrum dominance. So the same way they're conquering land and territory and, and oil and whatever other resource, they want to use media to conquer the rest of the territory. So they said they want to control cyberspace the same way they control land, air, sea, and outer space, all right? So media are not just here. They're not just, that is really deep when that happens. Are <laughs> you not ready for it? It's wild to hear that, I said, wow. Um, 
And I know we have a tendency to see media as entertainment or it's just a movie or just a song, but I, I want to argue that none of that is true. And I, in another context, another discussion, I would argue often that if you, especially in this context, whenever you like a movie or a song, you should be more critical of how it got to be in front of you in the first place. So I'm not saying don't like it, just be more critical of it. You know, why do I like what I like and how do I know what I know is usually what I offer and ask my students, uh, borrowing from an old professor of mine. I'm not saying don't like what you like, but do endeavor to critically investigate why. All right. I'd like you to put the echo on that. <laughs> he's making it, he's making it. Similarly, in terms of media, we have to understand that, though, now again, this is another area that usually I struggle with in, in terms of these presentations. I'm not arguing that each and every one of us is permanently and consistently bamboozled by every media message we get hit with. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to make anyone feel less than. I am saying that those in power have been very clear in their own words that they want media to man manipulate us in our consciousness and our public opinion. They work very hard and work with, to the, spend billions of dollars every year. In fact, the advertising industry spends almost $700 billion a year just to mess with us. That's just one industry. But they're engaged in what they call propaganda, psychological warfare, or psychological operations, or public relations. These are all euphemisms. They all mean the same thing. And, uh, and that they are the primary means of social control. So Fanon, as we'll get to in just a minute, Franz Fanon would say, one, that colonialism is the entire conquest of land and people, that is all. So that's what we're talking about, just conquering. But he would also say that there's a two-pronged method. There's the physical method. You first come in and wipe out whoever's going to stand up as a warrior, wipe them out. And then the bigger work, actually, is manipulating the minds of everyone who's left standing. The physical stuff, on some level, logically, is even easier, and in some ways, in terms of carrying it out practically, is easier to kill a bunch of people than to keep them alive but manipulate them so that they don't become a threat. That requires more work, which is why those of us in the United States are the most heavily propagandized people in the world, by far, in human history. Even. Fewer people control more ability to reach us with their media product than ever before. They have greater penetration and reach, more control, tightly owned and, and, manip and, and, and uh, controlled, and with a, with a, a greater ability to, to, in a sophisticated way, really mess with us. All right, so I just want to start with that. And then again, because it's his birthday, or just in general, I, Malcolm is always worthy of, of discussion. We have to remember this basic point. The media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and make the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. And he was as right then in 1964, I think, when this quote was said, as he would be saying it in 2018. In fact, now it would be even more so. Uh, the media system today makes what was going on back then look like, you know, I don't know, Sesame Street or something, I don't know, something, something real simple. All right, the function and development of mythology. Just a couple points on that as we're talking about the myth of black buying power. In this great book about Kwame Nkrumah, uh, this point was made by Ahmad Rahman. The process of colonization was itself a far-reaching psychological operation called psyops in the parlance of modern warfare. Propaganda or myth-making and symbol manipulation were the colonialists' essential catechism for centuries. Colonialism itself was an ideolo ideology of combat. The metropole's propaganda, symbols, and myth-making were as crucial as bullets in the effort to pacify the colony. I, I love that quote. But that's exactly right. It's not just words. I mean, I, I say this in my class all the time. I mean, it's really, like, if you just think about the ability, like, my, like Huey Newton defined power as the ability to define phenomena and have it act in a desired manner. So I ask my students this. Now imagine this. In this moment, I am defined as a presenter. You are defined as an audience. And we are engaged in a relationship. But just imagine what your behavior would be right now if for some immediate reason the definition of me or my presence here changed from presenter to hostile assailant. How would you all behave? 
Not a rhetorical question. Would you sit there with your pen on your pad? What do you say? He'd be aggressive. He's sitting there with his little man on his lap. He thinks I'm a threat is a problem. In other words, you're all behaving in a certain way based on the public opinion set or the definition set of this moment. If, if, so just imagine the ability to manipulate that definition. You can make people do anything at that point. And this is essential. You can't just kill people and put a gun to their head and say, do what I want you to do, because then they'll resist. History is very clear. As soon as people realize they're being oppressed, the resistance is, is almost immediate. And those in power study this. So they're saying, we can't just keep doing that because they fight too much. <laughs> Dag it. They fight. Now, this book, John Potash is this white dude from Baltimore County who's done some of the best research on the history of Tupac Shakur. And he put me onto this book years ago, and I always give him credit for this because this book is, is a monster. If you want to understand anything about any of what we're talking about today, you got to get this book. And I think she even updated it a couple years later. It's the Cultural Cold War, the CIA and uh, the CIA and the world of arts and letters, the Cultural Cold War. And what Frances Stoner Saunders does in this book is she, she brings it out to a macro-European context. And she, she talks about how England and the United States after World War II worked to just basically set up a, a global cultural propaganda matrix where they would create magazines and TV programs and, and, and make it about art, seemingly about art and entertainment. But all of it was about politics and putting ideas against communism and and, and, and they would set up book reviewers to write book reviews about books coming out that might push people in a certain direction. And their point was, we have to be everywhere. We can't just be shooting these people. We have to set up an entire apparatus that will say something else is happening. So I read this quote, it's a little long, but it's, it's worth it. Propaganda was defined as an organized effort or movement to disseminate information or a particular doctrine by means of news, Special arguments or appeals designed to influence the thoughts and actions of any given group. A vital constituent of this effort was psychological warfare, which was defined as the planned use by a nation of propaganda and activities other than combat, which communicate ideas and information intended to influence the opinions, attitudes, emotions, and behavior of foreign groups in ways that will support the achievement of national aims. Further, the most effective kind of propaganda was defined as the kind where the subject moves in the direction you desire for reasons which he believes to be his own. It is useless to dispute these definitions. They are littered across government documents and the donnays of American post-war cultural democracy. In other words, she's saying, there's no point in arguing this. You don't have to believe it works on you. But there is no argument here that this is what they are trying to do because they have said it and put it in all their documents everywhere. They've been very clear. And in one of my favorite books called The Science of Coercion about the history of the, the communication system in this country, everything has been set up. The field of, of study I teach in now, communication studies, was specifically set up by the political and economic elite to study how to manipulate people and create new citizens and create all kinds of things. Walter Lippmann said specifically, white people need negative images of black people as a self-defense mechanism. He said, we have to make black people look bad. Otherwise, we can't feel good. <laughs> I mean, he said it. And then I'm like, he's saying it. And people are like, well, he, it don't affect me. I'm like, it doesn't matter if it doesn't affect you. I just want you to understand that there is an attempt being made and why. All right. So as we start to transition to the specifics here, and I'm happy to come back to any of this uh, during Q&A or whenever, if you like. A new study, and I was very happy about this, I admit it. From the jump, I was very happy that this new report, a major study that came out of Duke University with all the big name scholars on it and some of the, the more popular, uh, uh, um, you know, like Antonio Moore, pop, I don't know what you would call it, uh, pundits, uh, this great report. And, and I'm proud that they cited my work in this in part because I've been ignored for so long and hated on for so long without anybody saying why he's wrong. It's always slick. They're just like, Jared is wrong. Why? It just don't sound right. He's just hating. He don't have no solutions. All right. Well, my favorite one, he's mixed, so he can't talk about black people. 
So my godfather said, my godfather, I love him to death. He's short. So my godfather said, when they say that to you, then you say to them. He said, he said they used to say that to me all the time. Well, you're just a little man from Cincinnati. And he was like, well, what would you say then if I was tall? Right? So in other words, if I was the blackest, most blackest, 100% blackest, black, black, and made the same exact argument, what then would you say was wrong? Now you're too black. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. But the point is, nobody will say, here's what he said, and this is where I can prove he went wrong with his analysis, and this is why we need to listen to somebody else. So that's why I keep putting this work out there. It, it does not help my career. In fact, quite the opposite. It does not make me any money. I promise you that. It doesn't make me popular. It doesn't do anything for me other than the, self, the selfish desire to put something accurate out into the world and know I'm right. And to try to make some sense for other people. But anyway, so this report cites my work, but the, it, 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 it more fully encapsulates all that is wrong with the economic analyses that we often hear about why black people aren't really doing as bad as you think, or that the reason black people are doing so poorly is because they are themselves uh, um, incapable of figuring this out. So what we get wrong with the racial wealth gap with lead uh, uh, authors William Darity, Derek Hamilton, Argues simply, and, I, and I, you know, the, by the way, please go to imixwhatilike.org for more on all of this. I, I should have said that from the beginning. The, my full work on the buying power thing is up there. This report is linked up there. There's so much. There's so much stuff there, and it's all free. Just you know, whatever. Video, audio, whatever. The racial wealth gap is large and shows no signs of closing. Recent data from Survey of Income and Program Participation shows that black households hold less than seven cents on the dollar compared to white households. The, the white household living near the poverty line typically has $18,000 in wealth, while black households in similar economic straits typically have a median wealth near zero. This means in turn that many black families have a negative net worth. Now we have to understand at least this very basic point. Now, I would love to talk about capitalism. I would love to talk more about how economically the system is designed specifically to create the inequality that we have. Capitalism requires poverty. It requires suppressed labor. It requires, I mean, everything we're seeing is necessary and functions perfectly for capitalism because that's how you get the wealth that is now being accumulated more and more at the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of the world's population. So that's how you have five white people in this country who have more land than all of black America combined. That's the kind of, that's what we're talking about here. So this is not an issue of black people just don't know how to spend money and save money. This is an issue of policy, of, of, of histories of imperialism, of government and state influence, of, of uh, capitalist aggression, of white supremacist hostility. I mean, this, this, is, this is the result of, of systems of oppression. It's, it's not about anything else. So what this requires is, and this, those who study propaganda know this, that, that more than anything, you need more propaganda. Noam Chomsky says that you need more, he says, propaganda is to democracy what violence is to totalitarianism. So the more free a society claims to be, the more you have to propagandize them. Because if we're in an unfree society, I just come with the gun and say, do what I tell you to do, and you do it until the revolution starts, and then I lose, which I, then I have to learn I have to come back with something else, which is to create a system of propaganda that makes you think you're a citizen, or there's hope, or if you save, you can be free, or if you buy black businesses or, or put money in black banks, you'll be free, or, or all of these things that are nice steps to take but will not improve anything. Propaganda is to democracy what violence is to totalitarianism. You need more propaganda. That's why we are the most heavily propagandized country in the world, because we are, we are told more than anybody how free we are. That's how you should know it's suspicious. As soon as somebody says, are you free? You should be like, stop. <laughs> All right, now I know you're hustling me now. <laughs> like when somebody's too nice to you on the street, it's like, okay, what do you want? What do you want? Come on now, stop it. <laughs> brother, brother, you look good. Oh, oh man, here we go. Here it comes. All 
right, so this is these are the myth basics that I've broken down into three, and I'm going to read them, and then I'll come back and break them each down and go to how I've concluded they are myths. Myth one, or basic part one. The claim that African America has roughly $1 trillion in buying power is popularly repeated mythology with no basis in sound economic logic or data. While the myth has a larger history, it is today largely propelled by misreadings and poor or false interpretations of Nielsen surveys and marketing reports produced by the Selig Center for Economic Growth at the Terry, Terry College of Business housed in the Bank of America Financial Center in Athens, Georgia. That alone should cause flags to go up. The people who are telling you how rich you are are Bank of America. The shady, <laughs> I mean, you know, all right. Um, and I want to say, I have to be checked on this, but I think, wasn't Bank of America the one that was started to help former Confederate folk, white folks after the Civil War get themselves back on their feet? Wasn't it one of those? Yeah, so, you know, but they're telling you, you know, it's like when the New York Times tells you, you know, which black leader you should follow, or where Washington Post gives you your analysis on Dr. King. That's what this is. So number two, buying power is a marketing phrase that refers only to the power of consumers to purchase what are strictly available goods and is used as a measurement for corporations to better market their products. The word power here has nothing to do with actual economic strength and there is no collective $1 trillion that black people have and just foolishly spend ignorantly to their economic detriment. It just doesn't, it doesn't exist. That's why I started at the beginning with that wealth piece. Black people don't have any money. And what we, what we do have is what we have after we've paid whatever we're going to pay or when we don't pay a bill. We have a little extra and then we can only spend it on things that are available to us. So when people say, man, stop buying hair and rims and all of that, otherwise you'd be rich. Well, no, I'm buying rims because I can't invest in stock. I'm buying hair because there's no land for me to buy and I can't invest in AT&T. Fanon put this beautifully years ago. Colonial, colonialism leaves us the trinkets leaves the, 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 to purchase. We, 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 that's what we're left with. Or, or and I'll come back to this also. We can talk more about this also, but, but it's the same thing. Like I can get a $30,000 loan to buy a car, but I can't get a $30,000 loan to invest in property or open up a business. People will give you money to buy what they want you to buy. And if you pay more attention to what's happening in this country, this country isn't making anything tangible anymore. So the biggest uh, um, product is financial service now. So if you notice more and more when you go to buy something at a store, they're not just trying to sell you a shirt, they're trying to make you buy a credit card or, or, or you know, get some credit because that's where they make their real money. The shirt you're buying in a store isn't making them money. The credit, that you use to buy the shirt is what makes them money. Interest rates, it's beginning with interest rates and because the products themselves are made overseas. But that's right, we don't, we, I, I still get called with that. This country doesn't build anything anymore. It only creates debt and financial service. So that's why you can get a credit card now, that's why you know, that, my, my favorite car commercial, you know, used to be, what were they in, in, in out near DC? Your car is your credit, your job is your credit. You can get a car. Just say, you just have to have a job and they'll put you in a car. But you can't go with that same job and get money to invest in, you know, something that's gonna create wealth for you. That's, that's, the, that's the myth. So then the third myth is, um, whoops. That the, that, it, that the myth of buying power functions as propaganda. Oh, wow. It functions as propaganda, and specifically to make people think that their poverty is their own fault. So that's why you often hear reference to this buying power thing. The myth of buying power functions as propaganda to deny the reality of structural, intentional, and necessary economic equality required to maintain society as it is, one that benefits an increasingly decreasing number of people. To do this, the myth functions to falsely blame the poor for being poor. Poverty, the myth encourages, is the result of the poor having too little financial literacy 
or as, a, as resulting from their bad spending habits, when in reality, poverty is an intended in, in result of an economic and social system. The simple, I mean, just look at the history of Donald Trump. He inherited wealth, inherited business, and then when he went broke, his name got him more loans to reinvest and buy more business to get his money back up. No one in this room can do that. You go out and fail as a business, that's it. That's it. There's nobody coming to you who's going to then, in fact, they were saying that Trump was just like the corporations on Wall Street. They're too big to fail. He was too big to fail. So they had to reinvest in him because his brand was too big around the world. So he literally couldn't go broke. <laughs> they were like, we're going to invest in you. We got to keep you afloat. All right. So again, this first myth is a misreading that, that, that we have this buying power comes from this, the Nielsen surveys. And what is Nielsen? You gotta look up, I mean, we don't even have to come back to that, but Nielsen is itself a company that is itself in the business of producing reports for other businesses. And I'm gonna come back to that point because this is where we get caught up. So this is how it works. I'm, this is an example of how this myth gets spread and developed. Reports like this one come out every year in one form or fashion. Nicely styled, pretty sister on the cover. Talk about black people are gonna do well. Look at, we're resilient. They keep coming back. Relevant. But relevant to who and on what basis? So $1 trillion, where does this number come from? So this is what the report says. Despite historically high unemployment rates, I had to emphasize that. You got to read that. Despite historically high unemployment rates, blacks have shown resiliency in their ability to pers persevere as the consumers. Black buying power continues to increase, rising from its current $1 trillion level to $1.3 by 2017. Now, how does a group of people with high unemployment rates, historically high unemployment rates, somehow economically powerful and strong? I hear you, but I don't agree. My point would be that the reason that we're being told we have power and relevance is not because we actually have a trillion dollars that we can spend any way we want. It's that we have, well, I'll show you here. I'll show you what the next thing is. Black buying power continues to increase, rising from its current $1 trillion. First of all, we don't have a trillion dollars. And this is where I'm trying to show you where that number is coming from. The second thing is that the power they're talking about is not the power to take money and use it however you would want to use it. It's the power to, you, to enrich someone else. So, when I'm, so if I'm the corporation, I'm saying you're powerful, not because you're powerful in the way you conceive of power. I'm saying you're powerful because you're powerful to me in your potential ability to buy my product maybe versus his or hers. Do you see that? I'll try to build on that difference, that subtle difference going forward, but, but, but it's, it's an important difference that continues to confuse the situation. Yes? And what, was, what is that number always compared to in regards to white wealth? Is it made of trillion? That's a great question. It do, they don't compare it to white wealth because, as I'm going to show you in a minute, this is not a measurement of wealth. And as I showed you already, we don't have any. So they don't even talk about white buying power. What they do is they talk about different segments of, so that, you know what, that's a good question. Let me do it this way. Buying power is broken up and applied to a whole bunch of different groups. So they'll put out buying power for millennials, buying power for LGBTQ community, buying power for, you know, generation whatever, for older generations, buying power for corporations, buying power for a city, buying power for Amazon. Jeff Bezos just had a conversation about his, uh, Amazon's buying power. It was in the, in the room. And, and what they're saying is, again, in those discussions, and I'll show you this in a moment, they're all being honest. This is not about economic power as we are taught to think of it. It's, again, about the, a number of things, the, the ability that they have to buy products that the people creating these reports are trying to sell, or it's, um, I'll leave it there, that's basically it. It's not that they, it's, it's, it's not that they're saying, and then, and then they're never saying, for instance, 
that the LGBTQ community could overturn all of whatever it's dealing with if they just saved and spent differently. Or the Latinos would be different if they did this. Or Native American, they actually said Native Americans have like $100 million of spending power. People live on $2 a day. What are you talking about? Well, this is, where I'm, this is where I'm gonna try to show you. So this is where the numbers are coming from. The Selig Center. And how do they get that number? Now, what I'm gonna show you here, I got 10 years ago from the reports before they put them behind a $125 paywall. One, I don't really have that kind of money, and two, I also don't want to spend it if I did on this report, so I'm struggling. I should get it so I can further prove my point to get the updated versions, but I'm suspicious this is why they've done it, not just because of me, but because anyone could start to see how they come up with this buying power concept. So the, the, the Selig Center defines buying power as disposable income or the total personal income available for spending on goods and services after taxes. Further, simply defined, buying power is the total personal income of residents that is available after taxes for spending virtually on, on, on virtually everything that they buy, but it does not include dollars that are borrowed or that were saved in previous years. Now, that causes a lot of confusion because then are you saying that if I borrowed money on a credit card in 2017 because, and spent a bunch of stuff on 2017, that in 2018, the debt I'm still paying on that doesn't count? or that it doesn't count towards, or are you saying, or similarly, are you saying that you are counting what I'm buying on credit cards as buying power? Because there was some debate, I had some debates with people over that too. Because if you're, because to me that was the clearest one. If you're saying, if you're counting buying power what I'm buying on a credit card, then we're clearly talking about something phony. I can't be rich then, because obviously we all know this. Buying, the, the, buying stuff on credit cards is not power. Does not <laughs> <laughs> but then similarly, this is how they, but so, so okay, so let me start with this first part. So partly, partially what they're saying is, and this is where they try to convince people that we have all this money, because they're saying we're calculating all the money you have and that you spend after you pay for taxes. Well, if we look at so Antonio Moore did some good work on this, but, but the, the standard number is, the last time I looked, the standard number is that the, the median black household wealth is less than $6,000. $6,000 for the household. Antonio Moore and Sandy Darity and others did this work that showed that if you really count it as it really should be looked at, where you're, not, where you're looking at things that don't really have value, it's really about $1,700. A study just came out a couple of weeks ago that said, that I, I think I misheard it, but I'm not, even, I, I want to say it was something like 90% of people in this country don't have even $600 in their savings account. That number may be a little high, but, but, but at the same time, I was like, how many people do I know have actually $600 right now in their, in their account? I got to see how close to payday I am if, if we do. Like, like, or how long would you have $600 in your bank account would be a better question. Because as Walter Mosley put it, I think it was Walter Mosley put it, that, that the simplest way to put it is that if you can't quit your job right now and live exactly as you live for at least two years, then you're poor. Now, I, two years, I don't even, I'm like, two months, two weeks? I don't know, like, we miss one check and the whole house is like, and we got a two-family house, like a two-income household, like on paper, we make money, but on paper, like relative to the average working family, we look good, like they, they like on paper, but one check, that, that government shutdown happened, we was like, oh. Uh, anyway, so they actually try to confuse it by saying that, that we actually have this money, and after we pay our bills, we run out and go shopping, and if we just shop differently, we'd be all right. But on the right-hand side, this is really how they were calculating buying power, because it's not based on real numbers, because black people don't have any money. And that's, again, why I started with those wealth and income disparity numbers. And it's, there's a lot more to say about that, and it's worse than that, but I'm, I'm rushing at least a little bit. They said black population growth. 
suggests that buying power will be better. Why? Because they're saying more black people will be here, so more black people here, more black people shopping, more buying power. But nobody trying to assess the actual economic strength or condition of a community would simply say they're getting bigger, so it's automatically better. No. No. Increased job opportunity. Well, yes and no, because as we saw, and as the Economic Policy Institute put out in its study a couple years ago, it said that black people are in a permanent recession, that even when the economy is doing well, black people are doing not well. So even when things are good in the country, black people don't do well. So how is getting more jobs necessarily going to mean economic strength, number one, if the jobs, when we look at the numbers, show that, that black men and women are routinely paid less than their white co-workers, the jobs they're getting are not the high-paying jobs, they're, they're underemployed, and, and all these, you know, so you, are you getting a job and counted as being employed, but you're only working 20 hours a week? The numbers are funny, so you have to look a little more carefully. They're just simply saying more job opportunities, more education for black America. The report I just showed you shows definitively that the more education you have does not translate to more money. Black PhDs are earning less than white people with high school diplomas. And what percentage of black America has a PhD? Anybody know? Not even. The last study I saw, saw said black PhDs, they put N slash A. Not even applicable, not even a sizable enough of the percentage of the population. So that's why I used to joke with my client, like you should look at it like it's, it's unicorns. When you see it, it's like a unicorn. And then look at the situation though. I owe a hundred and some thousand dollars. Do you know the student loan people that told me, they told me on the phone, they said, one of you or your wife should quit your job because the two of you make too much money to, uh, to apply for the forgiveness you need because you can't pay your bill. So I said, wait a minute. I don't even have to go any further. Just, think about that. So get the education, but then quit the job I got because of the education because I can't afford to pay off my student loans. I said to the lady on the phone, do you hear what you're saying? How <laughs> All right. Only 8.1% of black America is over 65 years of age or at career pinnacles at which wage increases decelerate, whereas whites are 13 and a half over 65. So they're actually saying because black people, there are fewer black people over 65, black people are economically stronger. But why are there fewer black people over 65 than white people? Because we're dying, because we get killed in the streets. We don't have health care. We are, the, 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 the one study showed that the level of PSD, PTSD in black people living in America is as high as soldiers fighting in combat. Exactly. So you have, so, 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 but somehow Nielsen and Selig are twisting this into something that makes black people powerful. Black people spend more than non-blacks on natural gas, electricity, phone service, footwear, and higher proportion of their money on groceries, housing, and women's and girls' clothing. There was a study that came out around the time this report came out that showed, I forgot the exact numbers, but it was showing like 70 or 80% of black and brown people are spending almost all of their income just on housing. So no wonder we're spending more on housing and groceries because as was shown even after the Freddie Gray incident. The local grocery store is charging more than the, the big supermarket that's farther away. So of course black people are spending more on groceries and on, and, and, on uh, 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 housing, et cetera. But this, they say, is a sign of economic strength. This is how they're trying to convince people that this is a sign of strength. Why? Because they're talking to the people that own the grocery stores, that own the houses, and own the girls' clothing. So they're telling the producers of, that, of those clothing and the producers of the telephone services and the owners of the electric, electric company, this is what black people mean to you. We read this and are taught, this is what this means for us. And this is a, a big problem. Yes, sir. Sure. Quick question, my man. Sure. When they define wealth, I'm, I'm not sure if you know or not. Mm -hmm. uh, when defining wealth, yeah. they define it as a house being paid off or still paying on it. Well, first of all, that's another good question because as I forgot to highlight here, they're telling you, this is where they're most honest, in this line here. 
Buying power is not a measurement of wealth. That's why I even highlighted it there and forgot to read it myself or emphasize it myself. So they're not saying, see, so this is where at least they're being honest. They're not saying you are wealthy. They're saying, they're saying this is not about wealth. So which should again tell us stop using this buying power stuff to assess our economic condition because we have no wealth. As I showed you earlier, we're zero. So they're saying this is not a measurement of wealth and any honest assessment of, of economics is the, to understand the, the true standing of someone is wealth, not income. And, and for anyone confused, the simple difference is income is what you're paid for services and going to work and wealth is what you make off of other people going to work and paying you. So as I tell my students, when I go to work, I get a check and, that, and then I become a sieve. And through me, that check goes to the phone, to the mortgage, to the babies, to everybody else. That's income. And I have to go to work for that. The people who collect that payment on the other end, not the person on the phone that you end up yelling at, because they're just another worker. I'm talking about the person they work for. All they've done that morning is wake up. Click. Yep, Jared paid. All these other people paid. Money, 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 money. Now invest that in something else. Buy up some more land or stock or something that will itself generate more wealth. We don't do that. We don't have that. So, there, so this is again why we can't be looking at buying power as an assessment of our actual condition. We, don't have, we just go to work, we get paid, and then we take that paycheck and give it right away to somebody else. That's it. That's not wealth. So they're saying to you, at least honestly, this is not a measurement of wealth. We're only talking to businesses who hire us to produce these reports so that they can better market to different communities to get us to buy their product. So they know when you're watching whatever TV show, put the, put the commercial with the black family in it on at 8 o'clock on this channel because we know. You've seen it at the movie theater. You go to see the black movie and all of a sudden the previews are all these other black films you didn't even know existed. And then you go see the Avengers and all the previews are all the white films. I mean, it's the same way. It's, that's, it's, just, it's just marketing. It has nothing to do with... So as I'm saying, buying power is a marketing phrase that refers only to the power of consumers to purchase what are strictly available goods. And I know we're in an African-centered space, but Karl Marx is right when he says that, that those who own the means of production are those who are in power. Those who own the products you are buying are those who are having the power. The consumer of those products is not in power. All right, so again, this is how that report works. So in that report, you have this statement from the report's creators. The reports have become widely respected industry chronicles touted for their in exclusive insights, data trends, and perspectives that better prepare marketers and brands to connect with this audience segment. So again, they're telling you what this is for. Now we read the headline and we run off and people go give speeches and get applause lines about how we have all this money and we just don't spend it correctly. And again, part of the reason this myth is so strong is because there's been a history of great people among our community misreading it. So it's Malcolm X's birthday. With all due respect to Malcolm X, he misread this. And in his speeches, you can catch him making reference to buying power and spending power and misreading it. Dr. King missed this point. Claude Anderson continues to miss this point. Boyce Watkins not only misses this point, but I think quite in a hustler fashion tries to sell you something to convince you that he's, that, that, that he's right. So he tries to convince you that to buy his business model, practice whatever he's selling, to show you that you have more money than you have. And he's, he's completely wrong. Who else? Who else? There are a lot of, Minister Farrakhan incorrectly references this routinely. And, you know, I love him to death. My older brother, former minister of the Baltimore Mosque here. I've reached out to him on a number of occasions. But brother, you know, can we get to the minister? Like, if I just, can we just get him to stop saying this one thing? <laughs> I don't want to get into any other arguments, and I'm not beefing with the nation. I just want one, this one little thing, because he's just wrong on this one point. And I always hate it when I see that because it always sounds like people are talking to their own community and saying, you all are stupid, you all are lazy, you all are backward. And that's not why you're poor. 
right. So, so it's just that one little thing that they're wrong. I'm not saying. So I just added this the other day because this is just another example quickly of how it works. So this study came out on Marketplace. Again, a news report on NPR's Marketplace talking about black women leading this black buying power thing. You don't have to read all of this, or if you want, I'll make it available. You can have it. But I just, I emailed, I, I, I sometimes I troll, I admit it. I kind of mess with people. I emailed the author of the story. And I just simply said, in your recent story on buying power, you make reference to specific data points on two occasions, and I asked her for her sources. She wrote back, and, and this, is, this is, again, on the right-hand side, you can see what she wrote here, and this is, this is exactly my point. Thanks for getting in touch. Here's a link to the Nielsen report. You'll have to click download on the right-hand side to put your informa information to download the report. The Selig Center study, unfortunately, is only available by purchase. I referenced their statistics that were available in their public press release and confirmed it with Jeff Humphrey Humphreys of the Selig Center who worked on the report. Hope this helps. I wrote to Jeff Humphreys and said, you know, I'm also doing a story and this reporter suggested I reach out to you and could you tell me where these numbers come from and walk me through it for my report. He has never responded. That's since February. But my point here is, is that the national press quickly takes this stuff about black buying power reaching $1.2 trillion, or $1.5 trillion by 2021. But when you ask them for their sources, it all, like all of them, goes back to Nielsen and the Selig Center. That's all, all of them, everywhere. Target Market News, all of their stuff goes back to these two sources. And as I'm trying to show you here, those sources are completely flawed and wrong, or they're interpreted wrong by the people quoting these numbers. You know, you also said that it biased the, the, uh, the companies that actually produce these uh, studies. Yeah, well, yes and no. I would say the bias initially, well, yes, the bias initially is that Nielsen and the Selig Center are producing these reports specifically for sale to big corporations who want this data so that they can market to various communities. So that's the bias. The bias is we're not talking to black people, number one. We're definitely not talking to black people about their actual economic condition. We're talking to each other about how to get their money, what little bit they have left at the end of the day, we want it, all right? We intercept these messages or have them brought to us as headlines, and then we, we, we get excited. And we don't check the data. We don't do the research. We just regurgitate the number. We got all this money. Why aren't we, why aren't we spending it properly? You know who got it right? My main man, George Jackson. And this is why he's the least talked about leader maybe that we've ever had. George Jackson assassinated in 1971 in, in either Soledad Brother or, or his other one, Blood in My Eye. He said, they keep telling us we have this purchasing power, but then they just add inflation to go with it so the increase in purchasing power doesn't have any effect on anything. So you get more money to spend, but they just raise... Like what Dr. King said, I integrate the lunch counter, but the hamburger that used to be 25 cents is now 225. So they don't have to say no niggas allowed. They just say the, the rent is now 1500 a month. Bye. See you. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> That's what they did to my efficiency in DC. They pulled out the fine print that said, by the way, you didn't read this part, but it says we can jack your price, your rent up a thousand percent. And that's what's about to happen. So they didn't have to say, you know, no, or no half niggas allowed. They just, they, they, they just said, your rent's going up. Bye. And I was on my way. Huh? Oh, yeah, the whole city of these, exactly. I mean, that's what, that's gentrification in microcosm. That's all they say. They don't have to put the signs up anymore. Like my man said, my, my man Head Rock in D.C. said, as soon as you see the Gold's Gym, you just know. And Whole Foods is next. And then, <laughs> bye, everybody. All right, so the third myth. All right, so as I said, the myth, fun all right, I'll just keep going. The myth functions as propaganda because primarily what ends up happening is that we are convinced that we're poor because we're just not spending our money properly. And then we don't challenge or, or redirect our efforts to collective work that addresses the political system. And one of the things that we fail to understand is that wealth is created by state policy, by public policy, 
by politics. So the interest rates that create the value of your money, the who can buy land, who can invest, all of these are political decisions that if we're not organized, we'll never, it, this is not something you can individually do as a business thing. It has to be a collective model. So one thing that comes up all the time and somebody, you know, is that, well, why don't we do like the Asians do and open up restaurants? You gotta look at the history of Chinese restaurants. Chinese restaurants are Chinese and US collective state projects. These are not individual entrepreneurs working out of their desperate situation and doing something we're too stupid and lazy to do. The Chinese and US set policy. Going back, they even said the only way, going back to the early or the mid 1900s, they said the only way Chinese people can come into this country is if they're coming as business people. So the Chinese government set up a situation where they gave loans to their own people to set up businesses in the United States, which were matched by other financial benefits from this country to set up all these Chinese restaurants. Public policy, politics, it is not about black people being too lazy and stupid to open up a restaurant. Now, this is a video, uh, well, I won't, I'll skip it for now, but, but to Antonio Moore does a great job of just explaining how race, race and wealth are separate in, in a 60 second video that we can even just, just sort of look at, uh, as I just say a word or two about it. But it just simply just shows you where all the money is and how little of it black people actually have. So that when you start to hear these, these issues of, uh, or questions about buying power, um, uh, it, it'll, it's a little more easy to see behind or past all the mythology. Um, the, the, the audio wasn't set up, I, the, and, you know, but, but essentially he's just saying that there are no black millionaires, there are a bunch of white millionaires, eight and a half family white millionaires, um, uh, and almost no black billionaires. And even if when there are black billionaires, that means very little for the collective. So this is why I keep saying like, I don't care about any more black rich people because a few black rich people does not, this is where all the money, all the families that have all the real money in this country. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think it's 20% it's of all the black wealth, no, yeah, 20% 20, 20 of black America has 50% of what little wealth black people have. So even within the black community, there's this huge gap you have a few rich celebrities and business people, and then that's about it. And then they get a crazy amount of attention, which makes us think, A, that we can do it, and that B, that's gonna be helpful to us. And it just doesn't work that way. And it's not because they're celebrities and they're just bad people once they become rich. It's that there's just not enough money to be spread around to help people. So as Derek Hamilton and William Darity have said, much of the framing around wealth disparity, including the use of alternative financial service products, focuses on the poor financial choices and decision making on the part of largely black, Latino and poor borrowers, which is often tied to a culture of poverty thesis regarding an undervaluing and low acquisition of education. Race is a stronger predictor of wealth than class itself. For instance, blacks and Latinos collectively make up about 30% of the US population, but collectively they only have about 7% of the nation's private wealth. So what they're saying and they're arguing in their report is your racial identity, more than anything else, has, is more of a predictor as to whether or not you're gonna be wealthy. And black people being shut out of the wealth producing mechanisms of this country have no wealth to pass down to anybody, which is why we don't have any wealth. And creating wealth from nothing is virtually impossible at this point. So I'll end this way, and then hopefully we can clarify some things in Q&A. Um, but I, I, in the original commentary I wrote 10 years ago, I ended it this way because I, I, I really wanted to highlight this point. Anyone, including black leaders who parade fanciful numbers before their unsuspecting audiences, so as to again suggest that irresponsibility is the cause of black poverty need to be checked vigorously. We need to get back to an increased intelligent and honest discussion of economics so we can be, be, we can be where Kwame Ture was when he left. As he and his comrades always said when answering a phone or when saying goodbye, ready for the revolution. So that's all I'm trying to say here today. I, I hope I've made some sense and was clear enough uh, moving somewhat quickly, but I want to end with what I said at the beginning. I don't have all the solutions. 
I'm only arguing that the myth of buying power is indeed a myth, that we don't have any money that, will, that can be collectively redistributed to, to, to satisfy the inequality that we have. We have to understand how capitalism works, that it requires political movement and organization, that money and policy are determined by politics, not by uh, economic decision making. And that if we don't deal with this, this myth or, uh, uh, or challenge this as a solution, actual solutions that we need to develop won't ever, ever be considered. All right, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much again for listening, and I'm happy to engage in any Q&A. Okay. Let's give it up for Dr. Jared Ball once again, family. So we'll give uh, Dr. Ball uh, a moment to uh, Get, have some water. We'll okay, okay, okay. No problem. So he he took his he took his sip. So he's ready to go. Um, a lot of information that was presented and brought forth to us. Uh, the information that he brought forth was something that could spark critical thinking. Something that uh, may perhaps challenge what we may have already came in the door with. So with that being said, now is the time where if you have a question, um, you could be able to pose that uh, for Dr. Ball. We do ask, however, if you have a question, then please state your question. Um, some have even said, uh, state your statements in the form of a question, all right? Because he's already given the lecture. Uh, but nevertheless, also, we have a mic that is going to be coming around if you do have something to say. So please use the mic, speak into the mic, so we can have the most quality recording possible. All right. So with that being said, does anybody have any questions for uh, Brother Ball? All right. Hands already going up. All right. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I do a lot of blogging, a lot of writing. Um, and I think that I was very popular a couple of years ago and very well liked. Um, on these internet streets and et cetera, when <laughs> I wasn't as well researched and I wasn't as well tuned in to what I was actually, you know, uh, going through, what black people were actually going through. And I started to really understand that, right? So I'm finding now that I'm being made out to be a crazy person by looking at these things and digging deeper and asking other questions and being more informed. And the more radical my thinking gets, the more that I'm, I'm seem to be being uh, ostracized and channels deleted, being banned on Facebook. My IP address is banned. As soon as I see my picture, it's a wrap. How do you, how do you deal with this? <laughs> how do you, cause, cause your introduction, you just said, like when you got up there, like, because when Chris introduced me to you, I went to your YouTube page and I'm like, this man should have a, a million subscribers. Like wh what, like, how do you? I guess one, one way I deal that? with it is not by being, by being unpopular. So I don't get, you know, I don't have a lot of views. I don't have a lot of followers or subscribers. And I think that, you know, so that allows me to avoid some of the hostility and, and, and struggle. I think that's part of it. The other part to the point you made at the beginning about being more popular, the more uninformed you think you were, is I think important. That we always have to remember popularity is political and there is a mutual exclusivity between popularity and substance. In other words, you know, fame and celebrity and popularity do not equate to being correct, do not equate to being substantive and often mean the opposite. So, so, um, a lot of reason why people are popular is because they are uh, offering something that isn't challenging, isn't isn't criti isn't critical. Uh, um, so yeah, the other way I deal with it honestly is that that I mean, so we were talking beforehand. I approach all of this initially as someone who engaged all of this as an activist, um, as someone who is far more hostile and angry than maybe he presents himself right now. So, so I'm furious at the way things are. And I almost don't care what people say or think or I, what I want is someone, as we were talking about before, I want to challenge someone to say something substantive about what I've said is wrong or what anyone is saying is wrong. So I rest on that. I just say, look, it, something, look I, I don't even think I'm giving a good answer. I, let me also say this. Sometimes it is frustrating to see people 
rip off my work and not give me credit. I've seen it. Oh, oh it happens all the time. I mean, it happens to everybody all the time. Or to see people um, not acknowledge your argument as they make another one that is, is wrong, even though they know you exist and could include you in. I mean, so there is frustration. So part of it is trying to be organized or work as part of a collective so that you're not out here by yourself. Um, and then, um, I don't know, that's, I guess that's, uh, yeah. That's, is, yeah, but it is a challenge. I mean, it is a challenge. That's a real problem, actually. Um, and then also to think about, look at, look at all the people that I honor who, I mean, you said what you said about how many people should be looking at my YouTube page. I mentioned George Jackson. I think George Jackson should be the first name on everybody's tongue every morning of every single day while these conditions exist. And that man was as brilliant and as real a revolutionary has ever has been produced and has been suppressed intentionally to the point where it's, it's, it's hard to find. You can go anywhere and people will at least know Dr. King's name. And my argument has been he is the most known and least understood person in the world, second maybe only to the historical Jesus Christ. But nobody's ever, nobody's talking about George Jackson. And, I, and that to me is, so I'm like, if they can suppress George. You have to take blood, blood in my eyes from his hands today in order to get out the door. So I'm, I'm grateful that it's still going around. He is, to me, that's, that's the man right there. And, that's, and, and his analysis and what he did with it and his, uh, you know. And he was right about buying power, which very few people were. Anyway, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Tassine. I was wondering if you elaborate more on um, some of the myths or misquotes that people like Claude Anderson um, may have used in his books, such as Power Anonymous and things sure. like that. Uh, well, I don't have the quotes in front of me, but but even my, my dear Amos Wilson, Blueprint, Blueprint for Black Power, and I, that's a book I've studied deeply in, in for years. Uh, it's The only thing that I'm saying that they think that they got wrong, and I'm not... <coughs> And as I was saying to folks before, I realize how that sounds with somebody like me, who, who, who am I, to say that, that I think that they're wrong on this point. Just this point. I'm only going to argue this point. They simply re refer to those numbers. That's all. They talk about the, the buying power as if it's real. And they talk about that. They talk about it as if we are just Dr. King, Malcolm, all made this mistake. Talk about it as if the reports that were initially coming out of the, the um, uh, Commerce Department were, were, were accurately reflecting the money floating around the black community. So you, that's why there are all these questions about the money rotating X amount of times in the community. Marissa Baradaran, whose book uh, came out last year that everybody should read, we have interviews with her. This is the, this is the I hate the way the site is showing up on this, but, but the 10 years of work is here. And, and in her book, The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, uh, offers a lot of details as to not only how banking works, how policy in, impacts banking and the value of money and how wealth is created, but uh, um, uh, specifically not talking about buying power, but addresses the point that we have never had the money in the community that people think we have had. And she goes back to the Freedmen's Bureau with Frederick Douglass, having to use his own money to bail out the, the Freedmen's Bank because it just didn't have enough money because black people don't have any money. So when you're telling poor people to invest and save, or in this case, spend and buy, I mean, you have to think about the logic. Just simply put, without even getting into the detail, the logic itself doesn't work. Poor people <laughs> spending to create wealth for poor people. Just in it on its face doesn't work. So, so, so I asked Marissa in one of our interviews, I said, you know, one of the questions I've been asking for a long time is, has there ever been a point in black American history where if every black person operated on the same logic and, and with the same understanding of, of, the, of, of our money and used it to invest in our banks and buy our, you know, businesses, support our business, would, would that have ever overturn the inequality that we face in this country. And she said, not even close. And the, the fundamental problem is because you're asking the wealth to be generated by poor people who don't have any wealth to start with. And wealth is created by wealth. That's it. You need wealth to create wealth. You can't. So 
I feel like I'm not getting it for you. Go ahead, ask another one. No, we'll follow I, up on that. No, yeah. I was just, I was. It seems like a standstill then now. Like, so where do you go from there? So that's my point. That's why I started. I don't know. No, I'm saying because you said organizationally and things like that. So I don't know. All the reason I say it that way. The, no, but the reason I say it that way is because. One, this is where we get into a lot of ideological political differences, and two, we're speaking publicly. And I'm a firm believer as a, as a former, somewhere I think is a former real activist. Now, I don't think what I do now is that anymore. You got to be in rooms with people you know and work with on a regular basis and have made commitments to and are off the record to have those answers be developed. Every speech that Malcolm gave, again, since this is his birthday, was, was the overt symbolic representation of what was happening behind the scenes that was not being discussed, which is why people to this day don't, are confused about him. So the reason I stay with that vague answer is because I'm not going because people who stand up here in front of cameras and microphones and who are individuals not representing an organization who start spouting, this is what we got to do, they're either lying or they're just wrong or they're just frauds. So that's what I'm saying, like, the basis of what is happening in this space already, that's what has to be built upon. And after these community discussions take place, the mic's got to get unplugged, the camera's got to get turned, and the phone's got to get left in the car, people got to go through, for lack of a better phrase, rites of passage with each other as, or, not as organized members of a, of a movement, then you'll figure out all the solutions. That's, that's the only way it's going to happen. So I know how it sounds, but that's why I said from the beginning, I'm only trying to get rid of this one myth because your point is right. It is a catch-22. That's, that's why you have to have a political movement that emerges and forces some real change. And that's why there, un there has to be a fight. And that's why I don't like getting into it because people don't, a lot of times I'm misunderstood or people don't want to hear that, but that's the reality of the situation. We, this, this is, I don't want to hear it, because I don't want to fight either. I got two little beautiful girls. I'm trying to chill. But if we want to be free as a collective, this book is really important, because what she does is she shows how it's really the elite organizing themselves with their wealth and their politics to set up policy to manipulate how, who gets what money and who is kept out of the money. So one of the reasons, one of the points that we, she and I talked about that was in her book during one of our interviews was that, you know, we hear all the time that, and this is one of the points that I think Anderson and Wilson have missed, the money has to circulate in our community. But that's not how wealth gets generated. Wealth, see, and this is why, again, I get hated on in some of my, my, and I understand, I agree, actually. That's why we have a hate awards. You should all listen to our hate awards, our annual radio show called the Hate Awards, where we critique ourselves and all the things that prevent revolution. It's like a fun, but it's hateful, but it's fun. And I hate on myself, because one of the things, you know, I love reading Karl Marx and all of them, but I'm, I'm very rooted in the African-centered traditions. But where Marx, again, was correct is that if you read his book, Capital, what makes wealth capital or capital wealth is its movement. It has to move. So circulating dollars in the black community is not how you generate wealth. Because what generates wealth is when that money gets taken out of the community, invested in wealth generating business or enterprise that then would get dumped back into whatever community. That's where the wealth. So white people don't just circulate their money in white communities. They invest in everything. That's why if you look up the, the chief institutional um, investors in every major thing, anything that you anything you own, there are private equity groups that own everything. And Vanguard is the one of the leaders. They own everything from Apple to A to, to, to AT&T to Verizon to Netflix to Amazon. They're the chief institutional investor in all of these. Why? Because what is a private equity group? A group of rich people who pool their money and put it all over the place to circulate it into everything. They can't just leave it in their little clique. They're sending it everywhere. That's why their money, they got hands in everything. That's how you generate wealth. Circulating dollars in a black community might at best create a few well-to-do black business people, and that's it. And that's not enough. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Shabazz, and... 
one of the things I want to ask you about is like about banks. Like mm-hmm. me myself, I really don't like using banks a lot, mm-hmm. just because if it shuts down, they get all your, your money and things of that nature. Well, not technically. Technically, it's it's supposed to be insured, and you'll get right. your money back. But well, that's what they say. But I mean, but I wanted to know: Do you feel as um as black people, you know, African people in this land, we should use, we should all bank with a black bank, or do you feel as black banks really won't help the um preservation towards black liberation and things of that nature. So they won't help. Right. And it's not because they're black and it's not because black people are bad. It's because, uh-huh. because banks, number one, are not here to help people spread wealth. They're here to create wealth for wealthy people. So, so banks collect people's money and then take that money and invest it and make money for themselves and for primary stockholders of the banks and the, the major people who have all the big investments in the bank. Right. Go ahead. And this, like, so yeah. this was like some of my, another question I have. Sure. Do you feel as if Black people, revolutionaries that when we get our checks, things of that nature, keep a little bit in a bait, keep our money where we know it is so that if it does something happen, something goes down, we all have a pool of money that we could quickly grab to. Would you say that's more helpful than to have than for everybody to put their money in a bank? I don't know what honestly I don't know if that would make much of a difference because right. if you're talking about a point a point in society where banks are shutting down and closing down, the money you have isn't going to be worth anything anyway. Right. Um, and and you know we've been long watching to move away from a cashless to move to a cashless society anyway. So there's not mm-hmm. they're trying to get to the point where there is no cash. Right. So there won't be. But but the point is even if you have the cash, the cash is the value of the money in your pocket is politically determined. It's a social construct. So as Noam, Chom- Noam Chomsky points out, he, his, his point is that there's a virtual parliament that runs the world where major investors using high-speed investment computing technology are investing in things all over the world every nanosecond. And that is what is, in fact, making the decisions about politics around the world. Where do people invest? So a few years ago, when people got upset with what Argentina was doing, all the rich people pulled their money, the economy collapsed, and everything fell to pieces, and the people who were asking questions like you were like, <laughs> I might have a few dollars squirreled away, or pesos, or whatever they're working on, whatever, what was it, what are the currency, but it's not worth anything. And then when you, then you have to take that money and go somewhere with it, and someone has to agree to give you something in exchange for that money. That's a whole social contract. So if you want my water and I'm looking at you, that dollar in your pocket isn't worth anything to me. You can't have my water. So I just want to make one point. I, this, is, this is George Jackson's quote that I found. It's on the blog I keep here. So what is to be done after a revolution has failed, after our enemies have created a conservative mass society based on meaningless electoral politics, spectator sports, and 3% annual rise in purchasing power strictly regulated to negate itself with a corresponding rise in the cost of living? What is to be done about an expertly, scientifically calculated contrapositive mobilization of an entire society? What can we do with the people who have gone through the authoritarian process and come out sick to the core? There will be a fight. That's my man. I get so, I'm so amped right now. I wish I was still going to the gym. I feel like I could just lift this whole thing out the damn, excuse me, sorry. I get amped with George. Cause look, that's what he's saying. And when he said, he had that other quote I sent out the other day when he was talking, when, when they gave Kendrick a Pulitzer and people got all happy. George had a line, he would say something about, we don't want awards. He said, when people like, he said something like, when people like, when revolutionaries see something like awards, he said, we don't get happy, we dig graves. Woo! <laughs> now George scares me, but that's why our standards have to be high. We need to be uncomfortable. We need to be uncomfortable. I was trying to look. I debated the, briefly the president of Industrial Bank in D.C. <laughs> you can. I don't like industrial. That's why I keep on running out. I'm not judging you. This is not a judgment of you. What I'm saying is you can find the, the, the video and the audio on this, this blog and listen to it and check it out for yourself. I would argue either he was being honest and lying or he just doesn't understand the concept. But what he was saying is he, first of all, I show you on here somewhere, I show you how all the black banks combined wouldn't even make the top 15 of, of, of the top banks in the world. So even if you took all the black money and all the black banks and somehow 
put them under our control and we were the governing body and we said, we're going to save our people, we would realize we don't have enough. And that, we were, and that what we are competing with are people who have resources at 100,000 times what we're dealing with. There is no catching up is the point I'm getting at. There is no, the imbalance that exists, in other words, there can only be a 1% if there is a 99. So the 1% constantly cre recreate the 99 so that they can stay in the one. It's the same thing when you get on a plane. I'm only in first class because you're in coach. When I used to go to the club, literally the, the, the rope would be right here. And they would say, you're in VIP and I'm on this side. We're the same. But the only reason I'm over here and you're over there is because I'm over here. When I'm driving my girls to their soccer games and they're looking at these big houses that we never see near where we live, I'm like, don't get excited and don't get jealous. Get angry. They're thieves. Seriously, the only reason they live in that house is because we can't. That's the, re that's the simple reality. So Industrial Bank is saying, so what really happens with Industrial Bank and black banks is a few black bankers make some money. But what do they do? They don't have enough to reinvest back in the community. They're not able to buy up houses and give it to you for free. They're not able to uh, uh, invest in black businesses to the point where you could compete with a Walmart. By the way, remember, white businesses can't compete with Walmart. Like we forget, my wife had to take a job in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and driving out there. You almost forget how poor white people are because we're stuck in this. White people in this country are broke as hell. Broke as hell. Convinced that they're better than us because they're white. They don't have any money. So what I'm saying is they're trying to make it seem like we can do something to over, over, change, change our poverty. They can't even do it, and they're white. I mean, my joke used to be that white men have to be the most depressed people in the world because they're told from day one this country is all for them. And then they still end up poor. <laughs> Like, like, we all know on some level, this ain't our place. So on some level, I think we rationalize, like, I'm not supposed to get it any better than this. And I think sometimes that hurts us. But they're like, from day one, everything this white boy is told is, this is your world. And then he ends up poor, living in Johnstown, Pennsylvania? No wonder he's miserable and on meth and all this other stuff. My bad. That's why Atlanta, the show Atlanta was talking about Florida Man, right? Y'all saw you guys? Anybody watch Atlanta? All right, anyway. <laughs> so I enjoyed the lecture from what I heard. I missed the first hour, unfortunately. Mm. I know. But um, I, I heard about it an hour and a half ago. Mm. So that was good. I got here, no, right? I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> so um, tell me more about Boyce Watkins, because I was becoming a fan. And um, you said some things. So All I was really saying, I'm sorry, yeah. So, so you know does, got... is there an, any legitimacy to his philosophies? No. no. None? None. Are you serious? Zero. Zero. Zero? Zero. Now, wow. why? The simple answer is one, because he completely misrepresents the concept of buying power and claims it because he has an economics PhD that he's an authority. One comment about PhDs. I don't know where I got this joke, but I say it all the time because it's true. I went, you go to undergrad and you think you know everything. You go to graduate school, get your master's, you realize you don't know anything. Then you go to get your PhD and you realize that nobody knows anything. PhDs, there, there is something to be impressive about. I mean, there's something of value in going through a, you know, organized study, disciplined study, but it does not guarantee that you are an all in all expert. All, and and what those of us who get PhDs should know more than anything is to be humble because you should know that there are so many competing ideas and approaches and you can't read everything. So that's why I'm saying when people with PhDs stand up here and they act like they know, they, they, it's, it, and people without PhDs, act, anyone who acts like they know everything is a fraud. And anyone who tells you to pay me for a solution to your economic problem is hustling you. Now, I'm starting with, that's my baseline beginning point. The real point is he doesn't, he misrepresents buying power and tells you and repeatedly says that buying power is real that black people are only poor because we don't save and invest properly, and that if you spend hundreds of dollars on my course, I will teach you how to get a million dollars, he said, in one of his videos. 
I can't express to you how low of opinion I have of that. Number one, because it's a completely false statement. There are not millions of dollars waiting for people to take to get if they take the right course from Boyce Watkins, who, by the way, is on the low selling his company to a white media corporation and fronting for Asian and white PR specialists who hire him to do what he's doing, to go into the black community and spread these nonsense, this nonsense. To add to that, you don't have a million dollars. He lives right down the street from me on 47th Street, Chicago. I know exactly where he lives. I know where he shot. And I looked up, and I didn't, now, now, now to be, to be more clear, I looked up his dissertation because he kept talking about his PhD in economics. I did not read his entire dissertation, but his dissertation is about, is about investing. And there's nothing that I read in the first, in the abstract of the first, or the chapter overview or in the first few pages that suggests that he is either dealing with these issues or is qualified to deal with these issues. And then I also say one more thing. Having gone through a PhD in media studies, having gone through a master's in Africana studies, I, am, I can say with confidence that there are a lot of people with a lot of degrees who say a lot of things that are not substantiated by fact. There are a lot of politics as to who gets what degrees and who gets put in what place with what degree. In fact, that book, and that's why I also say, I. I put all my stuff out here so people can look at it, review it, critique it, whatever you want. It's not, it's all for free. You don't have to pay me nothing. I have a support link up there, but you don't have to click it to get nothing from me. I want people, I dare people to read my research and tell me I'm wrong. Because the top economists in the world, right, on this issue in the world right now, co-signed my work finally. And, I'm, and I, even if they didn't, I know I'm right because for 10 years I've been doing this work and I've been reaching out to people. I've, look, I've reached out to so many people saying, please look at this because I can't be, the, I can't, I'm not so smart that I'm the only one to see this. I can't be the only one to have done this work. And economist after economist after economist after economist have told me, you're right, no one else has done this work. I don't even know what you're talking about. Those are the three responses I get from economists. I mix what I like dot org or at I mix what I like and I mix what I like. The I is not meant to be singular. It's a borrow. I borrow it from Steve Biko, who did I write what I like in, in, in South Africa. So I mix what I like is just a, an updated multimedia concept of, 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 of journalism and media practice. Uh, yeah, please, please check it out. And, and, and I have to say, though, we were talking earlier, I don't agree with her on, on things too much outside of this particular issue. But as I have here. Yvette Carnell's breakdown of Boyce Watkins is perfect. Not now. Absolutely. You can go to the website and look at it whenever you want. Let, let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, so I know you say you don't have the, the solution. Mm -hmm. um, I'm listening in between, you know, sure. and I heard some Before solutions. Run, between running everything. Yeah, I've heard some solutions, mm -hmm. um, some ideas, at least, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking... This, what, what, what do you believe that debunking this one trillion dollar myth will do? Because That's a good question. That's a really good question. What I hope it will do is, is so this is the, again, I have all these fantasies, revolutionary fantasies. One thing I hope to do, if this myth is destroyed, people will immediately have to confront, I think, the reality of the situation. Right, sure. So my, my joke used to be, and I think still is, is I want everybody to adopt all of the myths that are told to us from day one. Uh -huh. America's free, equal, civil rights solved all our problems, uh -huh. black people are their own, you know, just pull your pants up, change your name. What else, what else they tell you? Get real hair. Whatever they tell us we're supposed to do that's holding us back. Pull your pants up. Right. You know, for, for a day or two, we're not going to buy rims and hair. We're not going to buy weed. We're not going to do anything. We're going to be the first person to the bus stop. We're going to be out there in our suits and our dresses and all our names are going to be Susan and Michael and Anthony. And there's not going to be any Kwame's and all this other nonsense. We're going to do all of that. We're going to be out there <coughs> by lunchtime. We would have our George Jackson revolution because everybody would see immediately all of this stuff is nonsense. And I'm not poor because I'm lazy. And I'm not poor because my hair is this way. And I'm not poor because my name is Nzinga. And I'm not poor because my pants are set. <laughs> and then we would throw all of that away 
And then the fight that George Jackson was saying we, we need to have, what happened? So, so with that being said, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and in fact, interesting, because you can quote whoever you want to quote. This is an African-centered space, but we mm-hmm. have a lot of logic here. And we question, critique everything. Mm-hmm. And if, 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 if my saying is, um, what's African-centered is for, what's, for, what's best for black people. So it don't matter who it came from. <laughs> so, um, so I think that's in itself is worthy of saying this in itself is a is not the solution, mm-hmm. but a part of the solution sure. by breaking down the myth because we live our lives a lot on a lot of myths. That's right. And you mentioned many myths. Even to, to us, many of us believe that white people are, is is equivalent or tantamount to rich. And black people is equivalent in tantamount to poor. Mm-hmm. White people equivalent in tantamount to slave owner. And black people equivalent in, in tantamount to slave. And criminal. And reject. And all these different things. All these different myths that are in our minds that perpetuate the problem. So I, I, I would suggest that debunking the myths in and of itself is a part of the solution. I hear you and I appreciate that. I'm glad that's recorded. And I hope other people hear that, that they are, are the first to, to hit me up on YouTube or elsewhere and hate on me. Um, no, but, I, but I, 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 I got that. I appreciate that. And I agree. I just, I was only trying to be clear because often, like, I, the first question is, what are we supposed to do then? You just shattered this myth. By the way, my myth is only one of, the, I think, the 10 or so that are included in this report that address all of the problems we have. Uh, in understanding our economic conditions. So mine is just one little small piece of this broader report that talks a lot about, you know, how we misunderstand celebrity, how we misunderstand uh, 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 reports and and financial data, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, And there are a bunch of other myths, some of which you just outlined, that need to be dealt with as well. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to be clear that I'm not trying to say once you read my work or hear my presentation, you will now know what to do to go get free. I'm just trying to say, when someone says to you, we have buying power, there, there needs to be a critique of that, and it needs to be discarded as part of this solution. Uh, that, I would argue, is the, part, the solution I'm offering. Get rid of this as a solution. I hope, yeah. So, like, is there a way that we can use these numbers in terms of, you know, like, influencing, you know, like, our ideologies? Because um, I look at, like, you know, Burkina Faso, you know, with Sankara. I look at, you know, NJM with, uh, I think his name is Bishop. And is there a way that I guess we can replicate? Or Maurice you know, Bishop, the New Jewel Movement. Yeah, mm-hmm. New Jewel Movement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there a way we can replicate, I guess, our victories? And um, even, you know, reading, like, Emil Cabral and his, like, theory, I think it's his theory of, uh, his theory of I think it's reality. Is there a way that we can apply some of these theories um, to here and now? I don't know. When I think about the, those, those people and those ideas, the first thing I think of is that we, we, the struggle here has to be, the people that I point to for starting in this country are people like George Jackson, Malcolm X, Kwame Ture, Asada Shakur. Uh, only because they're starting here, with, with you know. Um, what I think, so yes and no. I mean, so you know, one of the critiques I have about starting with with continental Africa as the, the the you know Cabral is brilliant, but he had a land base that we don't have. He had an identity base that we don't have, in, in the sense that he had a, there was there was a clearer understanding then of whose side everybody was on. We aren't even clear that we are in a fight. We keep having people telling us that we have been included or we are a part of this thing now or we have more uh, uh, people reaching out to black faces to be, you know, that's why Kwame Ture said black visibility is not black power. More black people are popping up in spaces. More, um, uh, more propaganda is being uh, produced to suggest that we don't have the problems that we have or that we are the problems that we have. And so, so I don't know. The only thing I can, that I keep coming back to is we need to start with that form of organization. 
We need to develop uh, the same kind of. See, I don't think that the Panthers, and I don't think that 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 the Black Power movement. I don't think that they were wrong, and I don't think that their politics or ideologies were wrong. I think that this the most powerful state in human history obliterated them, and we. It's not that they were wrong. We just have to rebuild those movements. So, so I think everything that has ever been done should be done again. Everything that has ever been done should be done again. Um, and in the process of developing that, we'll find out the specific answers. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. I will say one more. Let me say one more thing about that. This is where again I agree with with Yvette and, and, and Antonio that there does have to be a political movement. That there has to be a movement that says we want the goods and services that we produce to be redistributed to the rest of us, regardless of whatever you claim it is that we need to do. So the fact that I exist as a human being in this country should mean I get X amount of X amount of X amount. It shouldn't be that I have to have gone through all of this first or somehow prove myself. In other words, the report they just showed the other day, what they say since 1980, from 1980 to 2015, the Pentagon says it has lost $23 trillion. That's the annual GDP of the country. So if you think about every single good and service and transaction for one single year in this country, the money generated from that. Every time you buy something, every time someone buys something or sells something or interest is made, that goes towards that $23 trillion. They've lost that. What does that mean? What does that really mean? Well, I was going to say something different, but maybe you're right. I was going to say that means that somebody else got that money. <laughs> say that again. So oh, I see what you're It's what only you're as good as you've right. been, a, being right. able to protect it, right? right? So they do have big guns. You're right about that. Yeah, so it's the most powerful nation. I mean, not because the money it generates, it's because the, the fear and the threat That's right. of them being able to take yours. That's right. That's right. You understand what I'm saying? That's right. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so I guess my question but, was, but let me just finish that point real quick, and then don't, don't give up the mic. I just want to finish the point very quickly that, that my point is, if $23 trillion can be lost by the Pentagon, that means that's our tax dollars being lost by the Pentagon. If that means we're on a year, this country every year generates $23 trillion as part of its GDP, mm -hmm. that means none of us should have to do one single thing more to have all the things that we need to be healthy, happy, and sustainable. You see what I'm saying? There shouldn't be, I told my, da my, my daughter's school the other day said we're gonna have a, a car wash for Puerto Rico. I, prohibit, I prohibited her from participating. Not because I don't care about Puerto Ricans, but because I said, I don't want anybody starting this nonsense with my daughter at an early age that we have to wash cars to get what we need when we have already contributed to $23 trillion. We have already put in the work. Give me some of that money. And that's why I'm saying we need a political movement. The money already exists. I'm not doing another car wash. And when we were at, at Dick's Sporting Goods and the dude was like, would you like to contribute to this cancer or whatever? I was like, hell no. And he said, why, you don't care about the cancer? I was like, of course I care about cancer patients. I got cancer in my family. Dix is a multi-billion dollar store. I just spent $80 on a ball and some socks and a, you want me to give more money? I just helped generate billions for this dude. And I just helped generate 23 trillion for this country. Don't ask me for one more penny. Not one more, I'm not giving the Red Cross. I'm not giving to nobody. The money already exists. We need a political movement that says, give us some of it. They're Puerto Rican, they're American citizens. What I got to do a car wash for? Right. right. Same thing, look at, look at what's happening in Baltimore. What do we need, what, what do people need to be out in the streets for? Give me the money, fix my, fix my city. We have already done it. We have already contributed to it. So that's why when people like boys say, now give me some more money so I can tell you how to make more money for yourself. I'm like, you know you're lying. You know you're lying. All right, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, what was my point? <laughs> no, in all seriousness, though, but yeah, you, you, you say the uh, this political movement, um, like, you, again, I think it's in a notion of asking, right? You know, it's a notion of asking, and I think that... Um, I guess my question would be, to some extent, you know, do we take, do we devalue what others value? 
Because if you value something that other people value, that gives them priority over you. So if we in that line together, and we both in that line, and you step over in VIP, you understand what I'm saying? That's only valuable because I'm going to the club, and you get in front of me. That's right. Now, if I devalue what the you club own, itself. And every, yeah, it, it makes it, 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 it takes the whole value out of it. So, again, that's why I'm being intentionally vague about what I'm saying about a political movement. A political movement can be anything. It could be Steve Coakley, remember, he used to say, if we have a revolution, your debt goes away tomorrow. So it's selfish. Let's have a revolution. I don't, why am I paying a mortgage to live in a house? Absolutely. Revolution tomorrow, my student loan debt goes away. Where are those anonymous people at? Let's start. By the way. You ready? All these, where's Let's Julian go. Assange at? All these hackers at? Hack that student debt loan database. You know what I'm saying? I, I ask that all the time. But... <laughs> But, but you make a good point. My, so so one, the one thing you said about asking, all I want you to, if you haven't already, do me a favor. Read George Jackson, who I'm telling you is my, in this sense, guiding light, and then tell me if you think I'm asking for something. <laughs> Email me. I don't think Jonathan was asking no, either when no, he was up to the no, point. Hell no. That's what I'm saying. A political movement is a demand. It is an insistence. It is an. It is. It, what I'm saying is, it is an. It is an unstoppable force that says this is not up for discussion anymore. We're not going to have poverty anymore. Every time we demand, we get knocked back down. Well, I, I, get I, get I get it. I get it. I get it. Let's be real. Every revolution we've tried to have, yes, it gets knocked back yes. down. The person gets taken out. And we're starting all over again. So I, what's what's the deal? I don't know. See, that's what I'm saying. I don't know. I, you're right. But all I'm saying is the revolutionary effort was correct. I understand so However, I don't. Now, now, what what definitely will not work, and this is where Marissa Baradaran's book is important. I think this is where my own contribution to this topic is important. What we know will not work and has never made an advance are these efforts at individual black business consumption, purchasing, uh, 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 banking efforts. The history on this is much more clear. The revolutions you keep saying get knocked back, and you're right to say that, they have produced advances. These economic efforts have never produced an advance. That's what I'm saying. They don't, because today, as Claude Anderson says in his own book, we have the same one-tenth of one percent that we had in 1865. Baradaran starts her book the same way. The differences in the two is what they say is how they got there and what we can do about it. So the economic thing has not helped at all. And, uh, um, and, and more to my point is it continues to mislead us into thinking that there is hope in it. We got to, uh, you know, again, Steve Coakley used to say hope is dope. We got to abandon the hope in, in, in this economic model survival thing. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, Yes. Um, <laughs> hey, y'all. Uh, um, yes, I just wanted to know, like, during the time during uh, economic collapse, well, like, when the decline of the dollar or whatever, the economic system, mm -hmm. would you suggest people to um, invest, like, in precious, precious metals like silver and gold or I'm, what? Again, the only reason I would say it doesn't make a difference, I'm not going to suggest one way or the other, the only reason I would say it doesn't make a difference is because black people collectively don't have enough money to invest in anything that's going to give an offer of return that's going to help the collective. So individually, it, you may be able to invest in some gold and come away okay. You might run off and try to do this Bitcoin thing or something else, and you as an individual might be okay. But I'm talking about, I'm only talking about the collective. I, again, I want to say very emphatically, I don't care about one more black person becoming rich or making it to the middle class. It, 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 I, don't, I don't even want that anymore. That's not, that doesn't help. It confuses everything. The collective is all I'm worried about. What is going to help all of us? And that isn't going to do it. Because, and the reason it's not going to do it is because we don't have enough to invest in the first place. That's why the Bitcoin thing isn't going to help. To, to make money on investing, you have to have money to invest. That's why the wealthiest people pool their money to create the private equity groups that now own everything. Because they even, they even understand that. And by the way, they're not even investing their own money. That's the other thing that they do that we don't do. They're investing other people's money. They're investing uh, um, uh, uh, you know, stocks and, and, and like, like, their, like their, their money money. They're not even messing with that. 
We're the ones emptying our bank account to invest in some Boyce Watkins money scheme or some some Bitcoin something. We're the ones doing that, and then that's why when it collapses, we don't have anything. When just look at it. When the stock market goes down, look at what happens to the richest people in the world. Almost nothing. Why? Because they own something else. Or the collapse ends up benefiting them because they buy up everything everybody else is losing. And that's why the Economic Policy Institute said black America is in a permanent recession. The economy can be doing good, could be doing bad. Black people, it doesn't make you, we don't almost make, don't notice nothing. I asked people, eight years of Obama, did you notice any material change in your life? Really? No. A few people said, I feel good. It's nice to see a black family, you know, but materially, no, because he oversaw the greatest transfer of wealth to the richest 1% in the history of U.S. presidents. Happened under the savior of a black president. He gave more money to the rich than ever before. Yeah. He bailed out Wall Street. He guaranteed them $22 trillion. He gave, when the, when, they, when the police killed people in Ferguson, he gave the police $20 million. <laughs> they need more training. So let's give them more money. I was like, imagine that. Imagine if the poor neighborhood that suffered a police violent killing was invested with $20 million. What if he had gone into Sandtown, Winchester, and said, here's $20 million to rebuild this community after Freddie Gray? No. They said, give more money to the police. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, Actually, I have two questions. All right. Well, first off, when I found out about the event, mm -hmm. I'm like, that's the brother that was on Tone Talk to my boy Watkins. So it was good to finally see you in person. Um, was I? You was on Tone. Uh, Did I talk about? You was de debunking the same thing, oh, the yeah, buying yeah. power. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, first question would be, do you know where the 200-year racial wealth gap came from, in regards to the origin of that? And secondly. Knowing that these numbers exist, should we as a people redefine what wealth truly is? That's a, I'm, the second question. That's interesting. On one hand, I want to say, yes, we should redefine wealth and say wealth should be like how we interact with each other, blah, blah, blah. But I don't want to, but I want to be careful there because I want us to understand economically what wealth is and is not. And we should understand that wealth is, simply put, wealth is what you make from other people's labor. And if you think about your life and the lives of the people you know, almost nobody, I, get, well, I don't even have to say almost, nobody you know makes money off of other people's labor. I'm happy to be corrected if, 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 if anybody knows, but I don't think any of us know anybody whose sole income is off of other people's labor. So that's, that's how we need to understand wealth. The other, the other question about um, the wealth gap, I agree with what the authors of this report argue that we should even start to question whether we're calling it a gap. Because gap suggests that it's something that can be closed. So the origins of studying the gap really are the origins of studying what happens to a group of people who are enslaved and colonized internally and then held out of wealth producing processes. So I agree with that. We shouldn't call it a gap anymore. It should be, you know, the the you know, I don't know, uh, permanent inequality, a study of the racial permanent inequality, because the gap isn't even closing. It's getting worse. Hold on one second, my brother. Like dominant society would have to completely stop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And we keep moving. Look, look, I even include stuff on this blog where, because one of the things I actually like to do from time to time whenever I can is li listen to the people who are actually making these decisions. So I have a piece up there. I grabbed it from NPR radio and, and annotated it and cut it up and edited it and put it up so people could listen. Nick Hanauer is this multi-billionaire uh, venture capitalist. And he's on the radio, national public radio, talking about, man, if we don't enact some form of socialism and give some poor people some money, they're going to come and kill us. He said, this inequality thing is getting out of hand and my fellow rich people don't seem to realize that it's making us unsafe. He's not, he's like, he was even like, he's like, he's not some radical. He's like, I don't really care about poor people, but I care about them enough to say, actually it's perfect for this. I care about them enough to say, I don't want them coming to kill me because they're so poor and desperate. 
The same way here, buying power is not the power people actually have economically, but the power people have to further enrich those already in power. So he's saying the people at Starbucks can't even afford, the people who work at Starbucks can't even afford to buy a Starbucks coffee, and that's going to cause a situation where they come kill us. So we better find a way to give them a little bit, sprinkle some more stuff down. That, by the way, is why they call it a gap. That's a sprinkling of hope. Oh, because a gap can be closed. I just got to work harder. Or get my people to be less stupid and irresponsible. So, I think the thing is so complex. And I think even that image there is part of the problem. Hmm. Hmm. So, just going back to what you were saying earlier. Now, when I look at this whole thing about white and black, I think that's also a part of the problem. When I look at it, where we really, again, going back to what I said earlier, begin to believe that most white people are, 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 the, are the quote unquote elite. Yeah. We believe white people are the elite mm -hmm. when there's a certain segment of white people that are the elite. And even, you know, it, it, it's just a certain segment. Mm -hmm. But the, as you said earlier, is that those others believe they have something because they're white. Mm, that's it. So that's the that's the thing. Keep you you stay right there that's and it. think you got something because you're white, and you stay right there and yeah, you're supposed to be mad at them because they got they got something. But or the reason you're white and poor is because these black and brown people right, are absolutely. doing what they're doing. Right. So don't look so, at the rich white folks. So yeah, yeah. So 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 fight the guy who's chewing tobacco. That's it. I say tobacco. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Right. So so fight him. That's it. You know, so sometimes, you know, I think that we just have to really debunk a lot of myths. Yeah. You know, I'm working on a doctor. Degree, and that's all I do is debunk myths. Yeah. And it's hard in the African Senate, pan-African black community. I got the red, black and green flag out the front. But when you come in here, there's a different conversation. So the thing is, some of what we think is going to help actually perpetuates the problem because we need to go a little deeper than what we than what we see. That's right. Because there's myths all day. And that was something else I was going to say, but I'm a little... I don't remember something. Yeah. That's all right. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the things that... The reason I, I like to talk so much about propaganda is because the, the, those in power have... You know, in that book, that Saunders book, she, she quotes one of these guys talking about... And it's such a... I'm going to mess it up a little bit, but it's such a brilliant statement. They were saying, we don't put people around... The, we don't place people in positions around the world and tell them they have to say what we want to say. We create, she said, she quoted this guy saying, we create a facetious set of criteria that people will aspire to, to get those positions. That is such a sophisticated and brilliant way of manipulating. So, so that's why when people are like, people are like, oh, oh man, Jared, stop you. Nobody put a gun in his head and made him go on TV and say that. Nobody put a gun to Don Lemon's head and Morgan Freeman's head and have them sit on this, uh, sit on CNN and have this long conversation about how black people should stop complaining about being poor because they could do what each of them have done. Did you all see that? Morgan Freeman and Don Lemon sat up there on national television and had this extended conversation with each other about how black people should stop complaining. And Morgan was like, they should become a TV anchor like you. And, and Don Lemon was like, they could become an actor like you, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm not, I'm not even looking, looking at another morning for something. I was like, you, you have, you have taken playing the 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 sucker role to a new level now. Like your whole career has been being the magic Negro in in film studies parlance, and now you're performing it on national TV by actually telling people, you should be an actor like me. Imagine that. Morgan Freeman and Sam Jackson been the only black men in like every movie. <laughs> So every other black male actor out there trying to do that is like, where am I going to get a job? And then look at, the, look at the fight that happened between um, the Iron Man fight between um, Don Cheadle and the, the, the light skinned dude. What's his name? Terrence Howard. They were beefing with each other over which Negro was going to get to play the Iron Man backup dude. I'm like, they, that's the whole point. There's no room for anybody. Even in the white world, the study uh, uh, is a little dated, but in the 90s, they were like, it was something like, 20 to 30 percent of all the money made in Hollywood from like 1990 to 2000 starred seven actors. 
It was like Tom Hanks, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and six, four or five other people, all white men. So even in the white world, there's no room for all these actors. So it's like, so how are you going to sit up there and tell 40 million black people that they should stop complaining about inequality because they could be like you and be like Don Lemon, the one other person anchoring a national, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like how many, you're right, you're right. On my way over here, they were like, Jared, come make six figures hosting CNN. And I was like, nah, I like being poorer than that. I don't feel like it. <laughs> anyway, I don't feel like it. I don't want it. You didn't, you didn't get that offer? They didn't call you? Oh, wow, my bad. That's, you must be tripping. You, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. I had a question about um, just that whole black um, buying power concept. How, I guess in their studies, how did they separate like black buying power from the United States, since you know you you know, and I guess in the study, it's still saying you're black citizens, right? You still citizens. So how did they say this citizens' money? You know, what was? How did they separate that? So 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 one thing is this is this is a video I have up on the blog, the secret of selling the Negro from 1954, and what it is is the the, the reason they separated it out, as they say in this video, is they're saying. There's, well, they're almost saying, and I'm going to fill in a couple blanks. I'll editorialize. You can watch it and see if you think I'm right. What they officially say is black people are showing up more as consumers. They're getting a little more free. It's the 1950s now. They're getting jobs. They're making some money. You better get out there and sell to them. Or, or a number of different things might happen. One, they might set up their own economy, which won't make them rich, but it'll let them know that they are not in this economy. And psychologically, we can't let that happen. And two, whatever money is floating out there, you gotta get it, not them. So it's just that. It's, and then they do it, and that's what I was trying to say earlier, they don't, it's not just black people, they do this with every, I have a Google alert set up for buying power. So every day I get like 20 emails saying, they're talking about buying power from everything from a company to a small city to a, 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 you know, to a handful of white people to black America. It's only with us that this myth gets blown out of proportion and used against us. No other group, at least that I'm aware of, no other group have I seen is out there. Nobody is running around saying to any group of people, millennials. You would be so much more rich if you would pull your bubble. They're not right. saying that. They're saying, no, millennials spend all this money, and this is how you market to them to get it. Right. So but, they just wanted to isolate black America. But, like, how it relates to wealth. And since... But it like doesn't. Even, well, right, but, but I guess in, in, the, in the falsehood of it. Mm -hmm. If they're saying, you know, this buying power, this money, I guess, rep represents it, isn't it, like... White folks that's giving the money to black folks in this sense, since black folks aren't creating wealth. So isn't it really basically black people using the money that white people gave them? Since you're saying, you know, we're yeah. not creating wealth. So it's still is basically white people's buying power. Well, this is well, well, that's interesting you say it that way. The only reason they call it black buying power is because for a brief moment, you have a decision whether you're going to go to McDonald's or Burger King with that $5 in your pocket. But it's still like their $5. It's just what you It's still to going to McDonald's or Burger right. King. So it's just like in media studies, the basics, basics of media studies, they talk about agenda setting. And agenda setting isn't where we tell you what to think. It's where we tell you what to think about. And that's the same thing with shopping. So they're saying, I don't care. At the end of the day, I don't care if you go to McDonald's or Burger King. And by the way, if I showed you this other thing I used to shoot, that I sometimes show in my presentations, if you go to theyrule.net, you can put up a, <clears throat> in fact, I'll just show it to you real quick. You can put up, a, um, you can just see how, <laughs> now I'm a nerd, so I'll sit on this thing all day. You can play with this thing <clears throat> and see how everybody is interconnected in the business world and create all these web maps so if you just take a company, let's say, uh, let's just say Aetna or this one, Affiliated Computer Services, I don't even know what that is, and you show the directors, those are the boards of directors, and then you find who, oh, there's nobody on here connected to anything. 
It figures I would pick this one. All right, let me let me clear them. Let me just do one more. Let me just do one more that has something on it. Aetna. They just canceled my mother's insurance. 85 years old. Yeah, we're going to deal with them. Though. Somebody going to get that one. Oh, wait, I didn't mean to do that. Show the, show the board. Okay, so this I just start playing with it. So you, you can start to see through, you know, a company has a board of directors. And boards of directors set policy for that company. They hire the CEO. They determine what they... And then they also sit on other boards. So they have what they call interlocking boards of directorates. So what are supposed to be competing companies are often linked up. So I just start to play with this. So it's like, you just keep going. So then, so Aetna's con connected to CarMax. And then look at, then you find somebody who's pictured as chubby. And then, and then they're connected. Oh, man. That was good. Oh, got to start over again. Anyway, you can, you could just start playing with that and you can start to see how everything is connected. So at the end of the day, all of our money ends up in the same 1% or really one-tenth of 1% of the population because they're all the major owners of all of these companies. And so it's like Coke and Pepsi are literally connected through interlocking boards of directors. So they're supposed to be the dominant competing soda companies. But at the end of the day, they're all working together. So it's, 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 of course, of course, because when you, because there are how many, there are millions of sodas, right? So, but, but they're all owned by two companies. So you can get Sprite or 7-Up. Or it used to be, what is it, Dr. Pepper or Mr. Pig? Or Mountain Dew or Mellow Yellow? Those were the competing, right? It was Sun Kissed was Coke and then Crush was Pepsi, right? Something like that, the orange, whatever. They have, and then they give the appearance of offering you variety. The same thing happens with political leaders, politicians, etc. They're all funded by the same. Barack Obama got more Wall Street money than any other president in history, but he was somehow the revolution. <laughs> That's the trick. So it's uh, um, anyway. I forgot. I think I forgot. What I was doing. Yeah, sorry. Yes, sir. So I, I want to take you back a little bit when you were talking about colonialism. Yes, sir. And the uh, the property that that. Um, Nigeria, you use as an example. Yeah. Um, explain that. Go, go into a little bit more detail as, as you said that uh, Africa, explain it. What I was trying to say, I think this is the point you were, that I was just trying to, to say very quickly that the same process that created what we call Nigeria mm -hmm. created black America. Did they, did they happen at the same time? More or less. I mean, it's the same imperial project occurring in different ways at different, different places. So, so, I mean, in fact, black, so, so I sometimes mess with my continental Africans, particularly my classes, particularly anyone who tries to break away from, from my pan-African fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. So when they're, when they're trying to be like, we're from the continent, so we're better, I try to politely remind them that black America is older than Nigeria, way older than Nigeria. Black America gotcha, as an gotcha, entity, gotcha, gotcha, and if we're considering gotcha, ourselves a, nas a nation, okay, I gotcha. we are way older than Kenya and Ghana and South Africa. Because they came about in the, in the 20s. They came up in the 50s. Ghana was 1957. We've been here since 16-something. Right, right. Got gotcha. you. Now, and, now and, 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 and one more point about that. The very names of these places. Nigeria is not an authentic African word or name. It right. was given to them by Lady Lugard and her husband, the white British colonial administrators. Thomas Jesse Jones, who set up our educational system here, set up the colonial education throughout the continent of Africa. So we're literally being taught by the same colonial process in our own respective place, which is why Africans on the continent are not taught about us accurately and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then in each place, you can buy what is available to you. So if you're a Nigerian with a little bit of money, you might be able to get a little bit of land or a little bit of property, but that does not mean you're going to be able to invest in Chevron, which is basically controlling their oil. And it doesn't mean you're going to be able to invest in, in the coltan or whatever's being ripped out of the soil. And it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to <clears throat> own those processes and own those businesses that take that raw rock that's everywhere, all over the place, and shine it up and say it's rare and sell it to everybody for hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
and say that you have to have one if you say you love your wife. I mean, they lived, they, that was a whole propaganda thing. To create love and diamonds so that they could sell this daggone rock that is literally everywhere. There's so many diamonds in the ground, it, it shouldn't be worth anything. But they steal it, put it in a vault in London, and say that it's rare. And then every dealer has to go to London to pick up their diamonds at the London offices you're allowed to sell at Kay and Jared and everywhere else. And that's why people think it's rare and it's so expensive. Propaganda. Then they hire Marilyn Monroe and say, say diamonds are a girl's best, fr best friend on TV. And that's it. Once you see Marilyn wiggling it and shaking it, everybody's like, oh, well, of course I got to have a diamond now. So, so propaganda becomes, uh, as you said from the very beginning, the tool that keeps us from understanding the power that we have as a people to overcome uh, all of this mess. And I would argue that the only power we actually have is in collective political movement, yes, social yes, movement, yes, that kind of thing. Yes. That's the power we have. That's the power. They want us to think the power we have is in, in shopping and saving. That's and that, not power. And that $1 trillion that we don't get. We don't have it. We just don't have it. And, and by the way, as I was trying to show you, Nielsen, one of the way Nielsen's, I, maybe I didn't do this part well enough. Nielsen concluded, part of the way they concluded that the, this buying power exists one year they did a survey of 80,000 black shoppers during Christmas season. And they said, what did you buy? And then they tabulated those receipts and they said, look at all the money black people are spending. They, and then they extrapolated from that. They said, well, if 80,000 black people spent this X amount of dollars during Christmas, then 40 million of them must be spending this much. But it's not real. And then what you buy during the holiday season is not an example of your power. It's an example of your desperate, degraded state. That's why we're out there beating each other up in lines for, for products to buy, to give to somebody to say that we love them. And we go into debt. The average black household has at least $6,000 in credit card debt. How can you, how can, at, at least, how can you be saying that somebody's powerful? Yes, sir. So, all right. It's no solutions, but... Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and I've already know, I've told them that you, you say you don't have the solutions, right? But I, I, I would imagine just listening to you have some theoretical framework or works that you're operating off of. Um, um, I heard barks and all these. So I'm wondering, um, is it, okay, what is your theoretical framework or works? Okay. But also, what does... I think I hear something like like the system needs to be re something. You know, <laughs> I, I won't put the word place. in there for you. <laughs> so, I mean, I think in a nice way you've been kind of saying that. Um, I just want to hear if I can. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. In, in in the original piece I wrote, I, I think I was very clear. I am. See, sometimes see. The only reason I hesitate is because I know words are loaded and most, most critics have Let me not. I am a radical pan-Africanist. I am, which I, I accept the Nkrumah Torres definition of that, that radical pan-Africanism is that all African people are united in one and should have a collective political movement that reclaims the continent of Africa under scientific socialism. The simple point is that, and I agree with Teray again, there are only two ways to have economics, to run economics in society. Either all the wealth is owned by a private group, capitalism, or all the wealth is shared among the people, socialism. And those two words have been twisted and misinterpreted and ill-defined and ill-represented uh, and dismissed as either Eurocentric or something else. But I think that's really as simple as it, that's where I am. So, um, uh, I said, I'm, you, know, I, you know, I'm with George Jackson, who claims socialism, Cabral calls, claims socialism, but I don't claim it in, in the non, I guess I would say in the non-racialized sense. I mean, I claim it as Fanon claimed it, I claimed it as Nkrumah claimed it, as, as Tere claimed it, as Malcolm claimed it, as a matter of fact. Um, which is why I would have liked to have been able to have Malcolm comment on this issue later in life. Uh, when he was more aggressively critiquing capitalism. Uh, uh, I don't think he would have made his same conclusion about buying power. But, um, but 
but I try not, sometimes I'm hesitant in bringing all that out because I don't want to get bogged down and, 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 and have people miss the point. But essentially I am saying that we cannot have, whether you call it socialism or not, if, if the wealth is not being consciously redistributed to where people need it, we're not, we're not going in the right direction. Uh, so on some level, we need to have some, I mean, like I said, we've created all the wealth already. I mean, so I think that that's at least if you didn't throw any isms in there, mm -hmm. just saying that will be suffice mm -hmm. because so I guess. Could I like to claim communism? <laughs> I like to claim socialism because I think those terms oh, no, have I'm not saying intentionally not to. mystified. I'm not saying not to. No, I just want to, yeah. But I I'm, like, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry, saying yeah, just yeah. to, yeah. just because people say, so what do we do? Yeah. I mean, just saying that in and of itself would suggest that the system needs to change. Yeah. So, by any... No. <laughs> it means necessary. Absolutely. We change the system. Yes. Right? So, in war, it's fought on all different levels. Yeah. You know, mentally, physically, spiritually, all types of things. Absolutely. Right? So, yeah. So, it's all about... But, so, but, but to me, I'm just saying, this, to me, and I, I'm often accused of this, that that is a vague... Saying revolution is just vague. So, when, so people are usually critical of me. And that's what I was trying to preempt mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For, for saying, you said don't invest in black banks right. as a solution to our problems, but then what are you saying to do? And then all you have is this vague political movement thing. I think the, I think the solution is, you, you said it, debunk the myths, okay. and then the revolution will begin. I like your version. You said it. So Bernie Sanders is on the right track. <laughs> See, that's a little more complicated for me. See, I think Bernie Sanders was, was another hustle. And I think Bernie Sanders did a disservice to our understanding of what socialism is. Now, on the one hand, he was on the right track and he tapped into the, 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 the righteous feelings of a bunch of people in this country. But the hustle was that he knew he was doing it in the Democratic Party, which was never going to allow him to have that nomination. So he hustled us to bring us, as Bruce Dixon of Black Agenda Report said, to sheepdog us back into the Democratic Party when we should be abandoning both of them but it was to give us hope. And then we went back to the Democratic Party and ended up voting for Hillary, who, as bad as Trump is, I'm, I still am convinced would not have been much better. Her, her, her express policies, foreign policy, economic policy, would have been, she would have probably had us in Iran fast, war with Iran faster than him. So I don't, I don't so that's, what, and, and then his definition of socialism, like he didn't really explain. He never took the podium on national TV and said, this is what I mean by socialism. He just kept saying things like, "It's a free education for everyone." Sure. College. Education. Sure. That was one example. Sure. sure. But but if he but for instance, well maybe I was looking for something that he couldn't. I think he couldn't do. But as I as I've tried to point out here, if he had said, "Look, we already generate twenty three trillion dollars every year." He might not even know that. That's if he doesn't know that, then he shouldn't have been running for president. He shouldn't be a senator. He shouldn't be. A, he, he shouldn't have anybody's attention if he didn't know that. But what I think he did know was that he could not win the nomination in the Democratic Party, but he wanted to be on TV. And the Democratic Party wanted him to be on TV because that was the most radical thing they could bring after Obama, and they knew Hillary was a bad candidate, and they knew nobody wanted to vote for her. So the way they kept all those people tied to the Democratic Party was let him run, let him run, let him run. And if you read the WikiLeaks stuff, they, they killed his campaign. The Democratic Party killed his campaign. So that's why when people try to blame Trump and blame the rednecks for Trump and all this other stuff, I'm like, no, the Democratic Party killed. I agree with Glenn Ford 100 percent at Black Agenda Report. He said the Democratic Party would would prefer to lose with Bernie, lose with Hillary than win with Bernie. All the reports showed Bernie would have beat Trump in a general election. I think he would have killed Trump. Oh, yeah. All the numbers showed it. All the numbers showed it, but the Democratic Party was like, we're not, but he's too, he's too radical for us. We don't want what he's talking about. That's why he's always been an independent. He's not even in the party for real. He just ran on their ticket so that he could get the money and get on TV. Last question. All right. All right. So, I mean, it is, uh, I mean, is Malcolm's birthday. So That's when he mean. went to, I guess, Africa, mm -hmm. was he trying to create that political front? Oh, absolutely. And not just what he was doing throughout the continent of Africa. It was what he was doing in this country on the low, working with the Organization of Afro-American Unity. He was developing everything from a political party to underground guerrilla warfare organization. That's the part people don't talk about. Like, like Malcolm, that, that was part of why he was traveling throughout the continent of Africa.
And what he was very clear on was that if we don't align ourselves with other people struggling outside of this country, we're not going to get anywhere. So this is, again, why I don't even care if people have deep-seated animosity towards other groups of Africans around the world. Strategically and tactically, if African people don't link up, it's a wrap. It will never get any better. Any effort towards reparations for black people in this country, I don't think can be can be worked at all without a broader movement. In fact, this is where I look, this is where I, not just global, well, well, global one, but I think, honestly, this is where I gotta get, got some pushback for this, but, but I do believe it. Tactically, calling for reparations only for black people is a waste of time and a complete useless effort that I think people are manipulating for, many people are manipulating for bad intentions. There are many good people trying to do good work. Tactically, I think it's wrong because you're never going to get a public policy move in this country to give money only to black people. Never, never, never. And then I also don't want money going just individually to black people. That's not going to help. I would want major bailouts of student loan debt, mortgages, land purchases, generational investment. So my great grandchild that I don't even will never know should have something hooked up for her or him. That's what I'm talking about. And the only way to do that is if you make it a national movement for everyone. And this is why I keep saying this thing called socialism is the only answer. The only move is if we would say strategically, reparations for black people has to be connected to reparations for Latinos, poor whites, indigenous people, whoever the hell else is being ripped off on whatever level, we all need it. And we need it in the form of massive structural Give backs. That's the only way. This this thing of only black people, only black people, white people are never gonna do that. White people are never gonna sign a bill that says black people should get a billion dollars. And then if they did, they would say the only way you can have it is if we give individual checks to individual black Americans who would then do what? Right back to yeah. Well, we had your, your colleague in uh, maybe about a few months ago, Dr. Wimbush, Wimbush speaking of reparations. <laughs> Look, Dr. Wimbush is my man, and I and I and, and again, I would put him in, clearly in that category of people who are, are are on the righteous side of that argument. And I'm only saying, as I was saying about the other people that I mentioned here, I'm only critiquing that one tactical thing. The concept is righteous, and of course, we should. Get, oh my God. But think about what we would have if, if you start the reparations conversation while Europe is never willing to do it, is, is that you would end up logically leading to the conclusion that everything Europe has has to be returned. And all of this wealth has to be returned. And that's never going to happen. Because why did they do it in the first place? To get that wealth by any means necessary. And so let's be fair, let's say, look, look let's, let's, let's give the devil his due, right? <laughs> Slavery colonialism and mass manipulation of hundreds of millions of people is hard work. And with all respect, I mean it. Like, I actually sincerely respect the effort that is done, even though, even if it's being conducted by my enemies. They, they are doing a m remarkable job. So they work very hard. They even went to war with each other to get to where they are now. They're never giving that up because we've asked nicely or because, you know, they say, they, oh, you know what? Y'all deserve some money. You know what you write. So last point, my daughter, my sixth grade daughter came to me the other day and she was like, first she said, and this is the best part, she said, Daddy, I think I'm finally seeing what you were saying about race in this country and all the people breaking up into groups. She said, when I was in elementary school and it was all black and brown, I didn't really see it. But now that there's all these significant groups of white people, I can see like all these pockets of every, the white people here, the black people here, the Latinos here, and everybody's hostile. And then she said, this group of white girls you know, said something teasing me in the cafeteria. And she said, I went over to them and was like, what's up? And then she said, you know, there was like an argument, disagreement, whatever, and she didn't get what she wanted. I said, that's the point, though. I said, on the one hand, you have your father's emotionalism, but that's not strategically wise. There's, you're never going to get the response you're looking for. In other words, you're never going to have that movie or TV moment where you say to the white girl, whoever, oh, why did you say that to me? That was really hurtful and mean. And she says, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry. Let me get my girlfriends together and we're going to fix this. And you know what? I, that's never going to happen. Even if they realize they're wrong, they're going to respond in hostility just as, as to save face. The same thing politically. 
they never is ne like the appeals have been made. Who can speak better than Du Bois and 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 whoever in explaining the problem? They're not. They don't care. They did this on purpose. So so that's why I say you know the George Jackson thing. The fight has to occur, however whatever form it's gonna it's gonna take. I don't know, but but. Uh, um, uh, if we're talking about the collective and not a handful of us doing okay, that's what's going to have to happen. So, he, I know you said the last one, but. <laughs> and can I just say on the record, in part, he's ending it because I said I have to go and say, because I have a commitment that I'm already late to with my children. So. He may be looking bad right now or whatever, looking like he's rushing me out, but it's my fault. So I thank you all very much. I'm sincerely grateful for this opportunity. No problem. No problem. No problem. So family, there's so, uh, been a definitely a good conversation that has been had, a remarkable presentation by Dr. Jared Ball. But what we also want to do is encourage you all to stay connected. Uh, we have a lot of programs, a lot of functions, a lot of things taking place right here within this institution, which it is an institution within our community, Temple of New African Thought. And so investing in something that is going to be empowering uh, here at the Temple of New African Thought, we do a lot of different things. We have a rites of passage program uh, for our young people, especially our males. We also have drum circle. We do meditation. We have African Center counseling and a lot of different things. So if you have the means to be able to contribute to what it is that we are doing by way of organizing, by way of uh, being a beacon of empowerment for the community, we wholeheartedly appreciate it. So the basket is going to circulate around, and we definitely appreciate whatever it is that you can contribute and whatever it is that you could provide so we can continue to keep our lectures going, so we can continue to keep our businesses going. We can continue to put uh, action behind this conversation that we're having today. So what we're going to do as we seal the deal, as we conclude a very empowering uh, event today, we're going to do our seven harambes, which means let's pull together, all right? So on the count of three, we're going to go down seven times and go back up on the last one, and we're going to say harambe loud and proud. Let's do so together, family. One, two, three. Harambe, 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 harambe. Harambe, Harambe, Harambe! I say, family, I say. Network, connect with somebody who's here, meet somebody you didn't already know, do all those wonderful things, family. I say, family, I say.